we're going to uh, we're going to start up again. So please take your seats. Thank you very much. Um, Gali, are you going to? Yes. Thank you. Uh, three speakers this afternoon, and then a discussion with everyone. Um, Beatriz Colomina is going to start the afternoon with a paper called Towers, a Post-Human Architect. Uh, Beatriz um, uh, was born in Spain and uh, came to Columbia University in 1981 as a visiting scholar and then moved on to Princeton uh, University in 1988. Um, and she's the founding director of the program in Media and Modernity at Princeton and also uh, director of the PhD program. Um, we are very honored to have Beatriz, the mastermind of this idea, here today. <laughs> the mastermind of what idea? Anyway, I'm really happy to, uh, to be here and to have this conversation with uh, with uh, people in uh, at Colombia and uh, in uh, uh, Pamplona, uh, this is a paper about, uh, in a way, in many ways, about uh, uh, Le Corbusier. Uh, towards the end of uh, of his life, in what is actually his last uh, retrospective uh, uh, work uh, book uh, called My Work of 1960, Le Corbusier publishes this uh, this map, a full page map of global flights. Uh, probably he has taken it from Air France. You, you will notice that the center of the world uh, is Paris. And, and then he writes underneath uh, this map, the world now has 24 hours at its disposal. Marco Polo took his time. Nowadays we say, here are your papers, sir, your contract and your airline ticket. Leaving at six tonight, you will be in the antipodes tomorrow. You will discuss, you will sign, and if you wish, you can start back the same evening and be home the next day, end of the quote. Air travel was, uh, of course, revolutionized in, in the late uh, 50s with the arrival of uh, commercial jetliners, such as this one, the Caravel, and uh, the Boeing uh, 707 that were introduced uh, by Air France in 1959 and basically kept flying time in half with the company Air France claiming the two best jets on the world largest network, which at the time covered 350,000 uh, kilometers. They have some sort of uh, kind of, uh, you know, how do you call that when you don't share your, um, I forgot, I'm totally just like. <laughs> but it was not just uh, a space that, uh, that has collapsed with the introduction of rapid air travel, uh, but time has also expanded. You remember that he says this thing about the 24 hours. Le Corbusier, in many ways, already foresees the implications of these new conditions for the architect, that his practice is no longer local and time is continuous, almost a banality today, when architectural offices with outposts in uh, several cities around the world connected through the internet and video conferencing, conferencing work 24 hours a day with the office, for example, of Stephen Hall in New York, picking up a project that they, or in Beijing, picking up a project that the New York office work on during the day where the New York office uh, goes to sleep. And it is not just 24 hours, but practically every day of the week. As Bernard Chumi uh, said to me during this uh, an interview this summer, now you work uh, around the clock, seven days a week. In Abu Dhabi, for example, Sunday is not a holiday, so you travel on Saturday so you can be uh, at work on Sunday. Now, in Le Corbusier saw the collapse of this uh, traditional space and time as nothing less than the emergence of a new kind of human. En route to India, in his favorite airplane uh, seat, uh, he, his favorite airplane seat is uh, number five. He, he notes, Jan January uh, 5, 1960, I am settled in my seat by now at choir number five, alone, admirable, one man seat, total comfort. In 50 years, we have become a new animal on the planet. So this uh, new animal, this post human, is uh, uh, obviously an animal that flies. The airline uh, network is, in uh, Le Corbusier's uh, words, is efficient uh, nervous uh, system, and I'm not making that up. 
look, for example, the what Le Corbusier says in Precision in 1929, uh, uh, he talks about the airline networks uh, as a new efficient nervous system. I mean, 30 years uh, basically uh, before McLuhan understanding uh, media. In any case, this hyper-mobile hyper, uh, architect is a symptom of a globalized society in which humanity will necessarily be transformed. Nearing the end of a 50-hour set of continuous flights, again to India, Le Corbusier notes, November 13, 1955, 10 p.m. Paris time, 6 a.m. Tokyo time. We arrive in two hours, 50 hours on a, in a plane. One could write a condition humane on the basis of discovering rebuilding airplane uh, flight, end of the quote. Already in 1923, in his, of course, most famous book, Virginia Architecture, he had already written about airplane itself as a product of high uh, selection, and those are images from the catalog where he's choosing the images that he will publish in uh, 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 L'Esprit Nouveau first and then Virginia Architecture. And crossing the Atlantic in 1936 uh, in uh, the Graf Zeppelin, you here have the Graf Zeppelin, he said he had discovered a new fauna, the machines, which included the Fontaine pen that you put in your pocket, as well as the airplane that handles the overseas transport of people and letters, and which includes this Zeppelin, in which I'm right in this very moment, I just had a look at the enchanting interior skeleton of the air vessel. What are its laws? Precise, dramatic, rigorous economy. And here are some images of the uh, Zeppelin uh, flying over Germany, Zeppelin uh, uh, went from uh, Frankfurt actually to uh, Rio de Janeiro uh, in the 30s. And, and here are some drawings of, the, I mean, quite unbelievable uh, luxury and so much uh, space in that uh, machine. Anyway, the evolution of these machines uh, stimulates an evolution in the very condition of the human, according to Le Corbusier. By 1960, Le Corbusier was speaking about uh, electronics as the brain of the new post-human. He says, and this is quite shocking actually, that in 1960 he already was kind of so tuned in with uh, new electronics. He says, electronics is born, that is to say, the possibility of letting robots study and establish files, prepare discussions, propose solutions. Electronics is used to make films, to make sound recordings, television, radio, etc. Electronics will offer us a new brain of incomparable capacity. End of the quote. So the evolution of the airplane accelerates not only the speed of travel, but also the speed of human uh, transport, transportation. The arrival of the ballistic uh, logic of jet travel reconfigures, reconfigures uh, both passenger and war. The genius of form, he writes in another uh, sketch, the genius of form, the super constellation, uh, is beautiful. It is like a fish. It could have been like a bird, but since the advent of the jets, uh, a new threshold has been crossed. It is a projectile, a perforator, and not a glider. I love this idea, the perforator and not the glider. No? And of course, this is the super constellation, which uh, is one of the, the planes that the Corusier totally uh, loves. Le Corbusier could, could, of course, uh, be said to be the first global architect, but in an age in which almost every architect is a global architect, it's hard to appreciate how radical Le Corbusier's uh, mode of operation was. As he wrote in one of his sketchbooks, uh, and he's on the plane between Ahmedabad and Bombay, November 13, 1955, and he writes, Corbu is all over the world, traveling, his dirty raincoat in his arm, his leather satchel, Staffed with business papers, with razor and toothbrush, brilliant team for a few hairs, and his suit from Paris, which closed him here in Tokyo or in, or in Amebadab, without the best. Yeah. Starting in uh, 1951, when he was uh, hired as a consultant architect by the government of Punjab for the construction of the new capital in Chandigarh, Le Corbusier went to India a total of 23 uh, times, right? Traveling twice a year and staying over a month each time. And here you have uh, uh, Le Corbusier in India, and here in one of these uh, lectures explaining his projects. Oh, and here with, uh, with Malro, actually, in, uh, in India. The pace of the travel was much slower than what he had suggested in 1960, um, required by the contract to travel with uh, Air India, a company that he loved, 
and compare very favorably uh, to Air France. The typical itinerary took him from Paris to Geneva or to Rome, and then from there to Cairo, Bombay, and Delhi, where he traveled by car to Chandigarh and moved around, uh, around Chandigarh by jeep. So, I'm in, in, a, in other words, a nightmare. But despite this uh, absolutely grueling uh, schedule, he seemed to be completely, uh, I mean, deliriously uh, happy uh, in the air, constantly making staccato entries next to drawings in his sketchbook, as he wrote, for example, in 1951 uh, on the plane uh, to Delhi. And here you can see avion, no plane. Two and a half hours, Paris, Rome. Four and a half, Rome, Cairo. Nine, Cairo, Bombay three and a quarter Bombay, Delhi. I have been in the plane since two o'clock Saturday. It is Monday noon. I am arriving in Delhi. I have never been so relaxed and so alone, engrossed in the poetry of things, nature, and poetry pure and simple, simple Apollinaire, and Gid, and meditation. Uh, the sketch books are really an extraordinary uh, diary of uh, uh, global uh, movements in the mi middle of monitoring uh, basically every detail of the evolving uh, mechanics of air travel, like time uh, tables, speed, the cabin temperature, outside temperature, food, airports, uh, etc. He becomes uh, repeatedly kind of ecstatic and, 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 and lyrical. He writes about what he's reading. Uh, on the plane too, which not surprisingly, surprisingly includes also other polemical uh, travelers such as Marco Polo and Don Quixote. Travel becomes an opportunity to reflect on travel. The plane is an escape from uh, what he calls the cacophony uh, and one uh, man's upmanship of the world. 1957, uh, airplane, uh, uh, 615 uh, Paris time. In this really atrocious, crushing life that I had been leading for so many years, these first six hours in flight had been a paradise. I am alone with myself, free. I read, I think. They offer me some whiskey, one, then two. I'm free. No one, not anything is bugging me, end of the quote. So according to him, you can read there, the, for, the world is full of stupidity, and the plane is, is, of course, full of calm intelligence. The architect bringing uh, intelligence to the world belongs to the airplane. Le Corbusier claims to be at home in airborne India. He even has, as I say, a, a seat that is reserved on Air India, number five. He says, call Le Corbusier seat. His seat has a name, the Le Corbusier seat. No? The airplane, he says, is his home, an asylum of salvation, in his words. Le Corbusier, Le Corbusier becomes one with the airplane, even designating an airline seat as his uh, natural habitat a place not just of comfort, but of total uh, comfort, a comfort not to be found anywhere else or with no one else. Zurich, uh, March uh, uh, 3rd, 1961. Yeah, this is the, the sketch. Um, 1.30, we take off on air in India. My usual seat, number five, huge space in super constellation. I refuse the Boeing because it is American taste, even when run by the Indians. Constellation, 500 kilometers an hour instead of 1,100. But here I am at home in airborne India. But the US uh, flows the world uh, with stupidity and human uh, mediocrity. Beirut, 8 p.m., Paris time. 10 p.m. local time, total euphoria. Paris was crazy, insane, threatening with imbecility. Since Zurich 1.30, I am in the super constellation in my seat number five, called Le Corbusier seat. This airplane is an asylum of salvation. So if the airplane is, uh, is the home of this new uh, human, its details become a prototype for a new kind of house on the ground. Having always used the aircraft as his image of modernity, Le Corbusier takes a specific inspiration from the airplane that he's living in, paying uh, very close attention to every little detail of the design. He admires uh, the interior, the reclining chairs, the storage bin. He even requests uh, uh, drawings from the designers. He is, for example, in 1951, for example, he reminds himself in the sketchbook on return to Paris, right to Tata, congratulate him on, on the plane bomb by Delhi, asking for drawings of the plane, right? And drawings of the reclining uh, chair, remarkable, 226 by 226 by 226. The tight economy of the space in the airplane also gives him ideas for his current project in the same way that the ocean liner and the car had once been the inspiration. In a sketch of a birth of an Air uh, France plane, he writes, Constellation, arrived uh, arrive New York, January 23, 1949. A cousette, 
uh, makes an adorable uh, niche for two to chat, oriental fashion. Why will one will not dare build it in a house? Okay? So one will not dare uh, build it in a house, but nevertheless, uh, only a few months later, he uses precisely this sketch to plan the rooms of the unité. As you can see here, June 11, uh, 1949, room one, room two, cross-section inspired by Air France Constellation, February 22, 1949, Paris, New York. And in 1961, on the Boeing uh, to Delhi, he notes that the cream uh, white casing above the seat, you see this drawing that he makes, could be used in the Ville Radieuse dwellings in Marseille as a form of storage, right? Even the dishes uh, in the plane interest scheme, and again, uh, uh, he, he writes in this uh, sketch, June 15, 1960, Paris, Ask Air France, where I can buy some stackable metal dishes like those used in the New York Paris plane on June 13, June 15. These are very simple, but very adaptable dishes, very shiny in flight services. Fellow travelers' equipment also becomes a source of interest uh, to him. It's like he's shopping already, you know. So he, he draws this sketch with detailed measurements of a traveling bag around, and around it he writes, Air India. A serious Japanese man, perhaps a minister, has this soft wire uh, board, a uh, high careers bag, find out about it to replace uh, mine. So it's like he's anticipating already the shopping in the, in the airports. Even the outside uh, decoration of planes become a key source of uh, inspiration. For example, observing the bright gleaming uh, paint on the metal fuselage, he developed the concept precisely for the enamel uh, painted doors at, at Chandigarh, as you can see in this sketch. But ultimately, what he wants to do is really uh, redesign the space of an aeroplane uh, himself. Seeing Air France as, in, as inferior to Air India, he repeatedly uh, proposes to the company to outfit their planes in a more uh, modern uh, way. The dream, of course, never materialized, which may explain Le Corbusier increasing diatribes against Air France. For example, on a, on a, a trip to India via Tokyo, he writes, October 31, 1955. Air France super constellation is not super at all. The first cl uh, class cabin, a line of portholes overlooking engines, the reminder five or six lines overlooking wings, you don't see a thing. Secreting uproar, Air India, first class cabin, nice portholes, table, comfort, elegance of the woodwork. So he hates Air France and of course loves everything about Air India. In 1957, he even tries to do uh, the Air France headquarters, uh, writing to the head of the company, this is state of French inferiority, he says, if Le Corbusier does airplane equ equals, he writes, international activity. Uh, so, in fact, it seems like Le Corbusier's real ambition uh, is nothing less but to design international activity itself. Le Corbusier's fascination with, uh, with uh, jet travel and the new space of global airline networks grows out actually of the relentless fascination with global communication that structure, as we will see now, the career of his career from the very beginning. Because even before transatlantic air travel became possible, Le Corbusier was already dreaming of a global practice through publication. In uh, his journal, Le Spring Nouveau, in 1922, he published this map of the world with the location of subscribers to the journal, which reaches uh, five continents, with dots all over Europe, of course, but in also in other countries, uh, in Africa, in Asia, and in North and South America, and even, as you can see, some dots in Australia. How important this outreach was for him is evident in his last book, uh, the, My War, where he published the, the map of the airlines, where he quotes the opening words of a speech uh, welcoming him to Sao Paulo by the state parliament in 1929. And this is what the politicians say, apparently. When the first issues of Le Sprinovo reached Brazil, we felt the impact of a great event. So, in other words, uh, the publications had preceded him, even made the invitation to lecture uh, in, um, in uh, South America uh, possible in the first place. In reverse, the tour in Latin America generated his book, uh, Precisions, out of the lectures. And here is uh, Le Corbusier that managed to get uh, himself a first-class uh, cabin in the Lutetia. And he's actually writing uh, Precisions on the trip back from, uh, from uh, Buenos Aires uh, to Paris. So pu publications generate travel that generate publications. And in the middle of, uh, of these cyclical engines, uh, projects are produced. From the late 20s on, 
Le Corbusier was repeatedly in South America lecturing and making urban proposals for Buenos Aires, Montevideo, Rio de Janeiro, Bogotá, and ultimately developing uh, projects such as the uh, Ministry of Education and Health, or the Cité Universitaire of Rio, or the House in La Plata uh, in Argentina. These are sketches from his lectures, actually, and this is the house, the Cruzet House in, in La Plata, or the unbuilt Erasuris uh, House in Chile. In his first uh, trip to South America in 1929, Le Corbusier really took his time, traveling by ocean liner uh, to Montevideo and uh, Buenos Aires. And here you have him with uh, Josephine Baker, which apparently he has some sort of uh, a short affair. Uh, and he is in a, in a kind of costume uh, party. In the, he used to like he likes to always dress like a prisoner or or, or, or a clown. Eh? Peter has something to say about that. He, since he's into psychoanalysis these, these days. Anyway, um, where was I? So he was repeatedly in, he was taking his time uh, traveling by, uh, by ocean liner to um, Buenos Aires and to Montevideo and Buenos Aires, and then mostly uh, by plane, where he was actually uh, flying with such uh, uh, pioneer aviators as Jean Mermov here. Uh, and uh, Sane Superi, Antoine Sane Superi, and here is again Joel Mermoth on the, on the left. And staying from September to December in Buenos Aires, Sao Paulo, and Rio de Janeiro. It was precisely in this first trip that he developed the first uh, sketches for the plan of Rio, basically 60 kilometers of elevated highway with housing underneath. He returned in 1936 uh, to Rio, traveling in the Graf uh, Zeppelin. This is one of uh, his postcards between Frankfurt and Rio via Recife. The flight was 68 hours just to, to Recife. Can you believe it? <laughs> and uh, it's really unbelievable, too, that Oscar Niemeyer describes him arriving in Rio like a god, first to step off the Zeppelin after a rough landing that apparently had worried uh, the local architects uh, eagerly waiting for him in the hangar. So there is uh, Niemeyer and Costa and Rady and all these guys uh, waiting for him. And uh, Le Corbusier arrived in this, uh, in this scene that had actually a really dramatic landing and it's actually not a joke because one year uh, later, of course, the, uh, the Zeppelin exploded over uh, uh, New Jersey, and that was the end, the end of it, right? The end of the Zeppelin. <coughs> the Corbusier published lecture and work all over uh, the world, developing urban plans. Some of them, of course, unsolicited for Algiers here, Stockholm, Moscow, uh, Buenos Aires. Here is Buenos Aires. More Buenos Aires, it almost looks like a constellation, the plan of uh, Buenos Aires, Montevideo, Rio de Janeiro, Paris, Zurich, Antwerp, Barcelona, New York, Bogotá, San Diego, Marseille, and Chandigarh. That's just the urban plan, plans. And completing buildings in such faraway cities as Moscow, Rio de Janeiro, uh, La Plata. Uh, here is the plan of, of Bogotá, and this was a sketch of the Bogotá. Uh, and this is Chandigarh, of course. And, and here is uh, uh, the buildings in, as I say, also all over the, uh, the place. Here is Tokyo in Baghdad, who knew that the Corbusier also did a stadium, uh, a project of a stadium in Baghdad, uh, Ahmedabad, uh, Chandigarh, uh, and even uh, here uh, in Boston. As the global uh, reach expanded, the space of his movements increased radically. His practice was finally unthinkable outside the travel. If in the 1920s he was already fascinated with the global distribution of the subscribers, in the 60s he was obsessed with the new kind of mobility of the architects. And here you have Le Corbusier actually arriving uh, in Zurich in Air India. You see Air India there. Uh, and it's very interesting in the constellation too, which is his favorite plan. Is, is he uses the airports like his, uh, his, his office, right? So he's meeting precisely Heidelberger uh, and the gallerist and, and um, Billy, the, his publisher, Boisiger, uh, in Zurich. In all these stops, he's meeting with, uh, with people, and here is with Bojanski. You know? So it's really his practice uh, completely unthinkable outside, uh, uh, plane, uh, outside yet, yet uh, travel. Even if uh, even you can go back and, and realize that Le Corbusier's architectural education also consisted of traveling. Speaking as he often did in the third person, he writes, at 19, Le Corbusier, like if he was somebody else, set for Italy, 907, Budapest and Vienna, Paris, February 908, Munich, uh, 910. And here you have him in Munich with an, an 
uh, I don't know who this guy is, nobody does. Then Berlin, 9-11, knapsack in, on, on back, Prague, Danube, Serbia, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, in parentheses Constantinople, Asia Minor, 21 day, days at Mon Athos, Athens, Acropolis, six weeks, and here you have him in the Acropolis, and the drawing of uh, that Clipston, uh, his friend made of him in the Acropolis. Such, he says, was Le Corbusier's school of architecture. So all this travel, according to him, that was his school of architecture. He had provided him uh, with an education, opening doors and windows before him into the future. Le Corbusier draws a map of his journey, and uh, here is with, I mean, he learned not only about architecture, but obviously about other things as well. Here is with Clipston. In, in the room, they are, they are sharing. Le Corbusier is the one dressed as a nodalisca on the, on the right. Anyway, Le Corbusier draws a map of his journey, publishing uh, uh, it repeatedly from 1925 on until the map of the, of the jet travel uh, takes over. The path, in other words, of the solitary student giving way to the nervous system of a new kind of human. Now, moving uh, to uh, the 70s, is, is if international travel was the architectural education for Le Corbusier, who never went to architectural school, in the 1970s, under the leadership of Alvin Boyarsky, the Architectural Association, the AA, in London became the first uh, truly global school of architecture. Boyarsky, who came to the AA from Canada via Chicago, used to boast that the school included the students and faculty from 30 countries. I mean, the fact that he was uh, keeping count already indicates a high level of self-consciousness. Even before he was elected chairman, Boyarsky, as director of the uh, Institu International Institute of Design, which he founded, coordinated fr from his uh, kitchen table in Chicago the first uh, summer sessions that were taking, took place in, in London, the first one at the Bartlett in 1970. This summer school brought together, again, in his, in his own, from his own account, uh, students and architects from 24 countries. Uh, he described it as an unusual, active, commuting axis embroidered by a network of, of lecture circuits and sundry snoops on both sides of the Atlantic. I'm going to talk about the kaleidoscopic nature of applicants coming from every corner of the world, Oslo, Santiago, Zurich, Cincinnati, Stuttgart, Trondheim, Sydney, Buenos Aires, Helsinki, New Delhi, Ljubljana, uh, Washington, D.C., etc. By the next summer, uh, the session of uh, 1971, the outreach had already expanded even further to include Tokyo, Lima, Ankara, Guadalajara, Brisbane, Amebadab, Yokohama, Stockholm, and Chicago. The faculty was also thoroughly international, United States and Soviet Union. I don't even know how the Soviet Union people got out. Canada, Cuba, Argentina, Australia, Algiers, Italy, Switzerland, France, the Netherlands, Germany, Japan, the UK, etc., and included such uh, figures as Arata Isosaki, Hans Collin, Habraken, Natalini, Jonah Friedman, Charles James, pa John Juan Pablo Bonta, um, Stanislaus von Moss, Peter Cook, Andrea Branzi, Germano Celan, Cedric Price, Gordon Paz, James Stirling, Rainer Banhan, etc., and etc. As if to emphasize the international, and here is another cover of AD with uh, some of those characters you, you have the time you can probably identify, uh, some of them. In any case, as if, if to emphasize the internationalism of the school, the advertisement for the summer session of 1972 had this multi sponsor image of an airplane, a very sleek, I think it's at the Havilland uh, Comet, uh, taking off. The logo of the school was uh, the front elevation of an airplane, uh, the machine that made it all uh, possible. The new Boeing uh, 747, here is actually the first 747 at all, will soon become the fetish of a whole uh, generation of students and teachers. A student, for example, uh, Paul Sepper, did his diploma thesis at the AA on the 747, and those are the images that he sent me uh, the other day. He's teaching somewhere in Texas now. And, and many faculty, and it's interesting also because he kind of uh, echoes the, the movement of the of the advertisement of the summer sessions. And many uh, faculty from Dennis Crompton to, to Bernard Toomey somehow obsessed about the modernity of the 747. Still today, I, I was talking with Bernard this summer about the 747, and he's talking still with great admiration about this plane, its modernity, the speed, the size, comfort, and affordability, of course, the, the capacity all of a sudden to fly from uh, the, uh, Europe to the United States 
at an affordable price, price change the, that entire generation. But also, I'm, I'm struck by the way in which they describe this aeroplane as, as if it was a new kind of, uh, of building. But it was not just uh, jet travel that uh, brought all of them together, but what, in, in what seems like an anticipation of the more contemporary situation of electronic social networking, Borjaski also speaks of the success of the summer sessions as cheered on particularly by the global village servicing, servicing charts and by the example of the linking up forays performed by the optimist on the London scene. Uh, in uh, uh, Boyarsky's uh, view, the objective of the summer session was simply to provide a forum and a platform in an optimum setting, an opportunity for cross-fertilization, interchange, and first-hand uh, contact. Elected uh, uh, chairman of the AEA on the basis precisely of the extraordinary success and, and you can say also allure of the summer sessions, Boyaski extended the same formula to the school itself, what had been a really very British, and here he is with uh, all these telephones on the table, what had been a really very British uh, school of architecture well known through its publications, many of which were little magazines produced by, by the faculty like Archigram, but also a student's uh, uh, journal uh, like this, uh, Circus or the Ghost Dance, Dance Time, and look at I me, mean, um, uh, became uh, in the context of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Oyarsky School a truly global school of architecture. The school inaugurated a new form of pedagogy uh, in architecture where the objective was not to educate the student architect in the profession, but Yasky thought that this was something that people could learn easily in architectural offices, but to immerse students in a global uh, conversation. The AA also had the first uh, commuter teachers, for example, uh, from 1976 onwards, Bernard uh, Tumi says that, that he went to, to London from New York every two weeks, and also uh, Rem started to be in a commuting too when he was in the, in, the, in, in the United States, because Elias Engeles kept teaching the, the studio, but he would go backwards and forwards. So it's really the first generation of, con, of commuters uh, uh, teachers. But it was not just the faculty at the AEA, which was uh, international and mobile, in the mid-1970s, uh, the government and Margaret, Th Margaret Thatcher, as you can see in this uh, letter, who was then the Secretary of Education, took away the grants that British students used to receive to support their studies at the AEA. Alvin then, uh, in the middle of fighting with Thatcher to, to regain these uh, this, uh, this grants that the students in, in um, England have to, to study in, in any school of architecture, the AEA was excluded. He starts traveling around the world uh, like in places like Malaysia, uh, Korea, Japan, to recruit uh, students. And of course, the internationalism of the school grew exponentially. Uh, this is a, a letter, that, a, a page that they sent me from the AEA recently that includes the, the breakdown of nationalities. And it's actually, it's incredible, no? There are people from Argentina, Australia, Austria, Barbados, Biafra, Belgium, Brazil, Colombia, Canada, Ceylon, Chile, Cyprus, Denmark, Dominica, Egypt, Ecuador, France, Germany, I mean, in you name it, Lebanon, anything, uh, Zambia, uh, Venezuela. Uh, the mobility of the students and faculty uh, was also part of the philosophy of the school. Boyarsky himself claimed he didn't have a base, despite the fact that he was the chairman of the AEA and lived in London. He said, I don't have a base, I move around the world, and so I always think of my activities as being involved with international uh, events. Eventually, uh, uh, Albin was rarely uh, to be seen outside uh, the school. The international network that he had cultivated through his own travels now travel uh, to the AEA. The school itself became a compacted global scene with publications streaming back out of, of it to the world. As Fred Scott wrote in the prospectus of the school in 1981, never had a head of a school inhabited uh, the Burford Square premises as intensely as the present, present incumbent. To paraphrase a fellow Canadian, of course, Mark Luhan, the building seems at times to be an, extens an extension of his central nervous system and at others he of theirs. What Le Corbusier had called the new nervous system of the airline, airline uh, networks becomes the, ne the nervous system of the school itself. And as with Le Corbusier, what started as an exchange and diffusion of ideas, uh, mainly through publications, uh, eventually turned into actual uh, projects. So the AA generation that circulated ideas uh, in teachers and in books 
will form precisely the core of a new generation of global practitioners, some of the best and most uh, mobile uh, teachers, uh, like Rem Kulhas and Bernard Tumi and their students, Stephen Hall and Zaha Hadid, will lead precisely an international avant-garde with major projects throughout the world. A generation, basically, that grew up trafficking in ideas is now trafficking in projects. An even uh, younger uh, generation, like that represented, for example, by Asintot, Hani Rashid, and Isan Couture, which here you have the Jazz Hotel in Abu Dhabi that was opened uh, recently, and uh, Racer Umomoto and, and uh, Nanako, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> Jesse Racer and Nanako Umomoto, I mean, mix them both, right? Uh, whose projects that, that only a few years ago we thought, okay, that's paper architecture, that will never get built, right? But it's precisely away from New York, and they're having their first opportunities, these young architects, to build away from the United States or Europe in places like the Emirates, uh, Latin America, for example, think about Carmen Pinos, this is the uh, airport of uh, uh, Racer Umemoto, or the tower of, uh, of Carmen Pinos in Guadalajara, I mean, think about, about it, but the Catalans really did not make a, didn't make any, any space for Carmen after she separated from, from, uh, from Enrique, right? They took the side of Enrique and she was never offered anything substantial, right? And it has, been, has to be Guadalajara in Mexico who offers her the first opportunity uh, to really uh, build. So it has become in, this, uh, in these places away from the centers, uh, uh, China, the Emirates, Latin America, that have become uh, the places for testing ideas and where new uh, figures are tested. Uh, and very often, also, it's also very interesting, is a former student going back uh, to their own country who makes the connection. It's definitely the case here in Guadalajara and definitely the case with Jesse Rice. So it's always a student that was at, at the school and, and, you know, goes back and somebody says, you know, well, maybe you could go for a younger architect. And they take the risk. And I think that's really uh, a positive uh, uh, theme. These new uh, sites of production are not only exper experimenting with young architects, but they are also experimenting, and it's important to notice that, on, in all forms of, uh, of the diversity. I mean, you have noticed that all the people that I just mentioned, they are women, or they are in women in partnership with, with, with men. I mean, that it has to be that the best and most important projects happen very far away is also uh, very significant, I think, a cause uh, for celebration during the uh, a steel conference here, uh, somebody, maybe it was Sylvia Levin, made a joke about the fact that, of course, it was a steel and there were all these men talking. But then, uh, which it was true, of course, I mean, steel, engineers, I mean, okay. But it was interesting because then somebody else, uh, he, who it was? Toshiko. Yeah, Toshiko Mori said, take it back. And I said, what do you mean? She said, take it back. You just saw two women that presented multi-million uh, pro projects, and this only uh, 10 years ago would have been unimaginable. And I think this is uh, something, uh, we always talk about globalization in negative terms. I think this is a, a positive uh, outcome. The most radical work, in other words, now appears continents away, away from the traditional sites of uh, academic and professional uh, power. Thank you very much. The next, next paper is going to be by Espiros Papa Petros, and it's about Le Corbusier and Freud on the Acropolis. Um, I'm very excited to hear that paper. And uh, Espiros uh, was born in Greece and is an assistant professor at the School of Architecture at Princeton. Um, and he was a fellow, a research fellow at the Canadian Centre for Architecture in Montreal. He's also a writer and publishes in Grey Room and the Oxford Art Journal. Okay, we would have to travel back 50 years now. What do I print? The sea, ever present yet deserted, resembling a field of radiant splendor. During the hottest days, the blaze of heat would merge the sea with the sky. Were it not for the curved lines of the rippling waves, one might have failed to distinguish the body of water. 
These little lines in Corbusier's sketches here from his trip to Constantinople represent the materiality of water. Sometimes they appear as flowing curves and other times as straight lines or mere points reminiscent of the water in post-impression in Flexignac, Van Gogh and Van der Velde. Were these lines not drawn, the sea would become ineffable space, an immaterial horizon view that is endless. Notation, then, becomes part of orientation, the intense need to punctuate or demarcate presence even in a liquid space as a graphic method of assurance. It is another way of diagramming one's position in a territory that is infinite and setting one's coordinates in the horizon. Vision is visitation. While traveling to Athens from Athos by ship and by reaching the port of, before reaching the port of Piraeus, Charles de jean and his companion experience a vision of being visited by the building. At the bosom of some arching hills, they see a strange rock with a yellow cube on top of it. It is the Parthenon and the Acropolis, says Corbusier. But it cannot be. It is too soon, or it is too far, and so the two travelers are left bewindered. Inside the desert landscape, the Parthenon appears as an oasis, a transitory hallucination which will inevitably reappear. The phantasmatic introduction of the Acropolis in fact repeats the vision that the young traveler had before approaching Mount Athos when in the radiant heat of the afternoon he saw the mountain rising from the sea like a pyramid. Mount Athos is in fact described as part of an abrupt cinematic sequence first like a solemn effigy standing erect for several hours, and then suddenly in a graphic form of enlargement with its 2,000 meters over sea towering over the ship. From the pacifying distance of the pyramid, we progress to the overwhelming proximity of the tower while regressing to the incomprehensible architectural objects. The side appears to travel towards you instead of a typical subject visiting a building. Trajectory. The story or cinematic scenario from which these two climatic scenes are extracted is well known. In September 1911, following a seventh month journey from Vienna to Istanbul, the 24 year old Charles de Duan Jean Heret traveled from Athens to Athens. Having decided to end the publication of his memoirs from the journey to the East with Istanbul, Jean Heret jotted down only very few cursory notes in his carnet of sketchbooks during the penultimate leg of the trip. However, three years later, in 1914, and while resubmitting his manuscript for a book publication which once again failed, Jean Heret wrote two additional chapters on his recollections from Athens at the Parthenon, based almost entirely from memory. In terms, then, of the written testimony of the trip, the Parthenon appears as an appendix, an addition that comes after the end, and yet it demarcates a departure. Turning into a supplement, the visit to the Parthenon becomes ostensibly autonomous from the rest of the trip and travels on its own. The chapter on the uh, Parthenon it was partially published in the Almanac de l'Art Moderne of 1925, while glimpses of it will appear in a number of later books from the ground crack invasion architecture to the late survey of creation is a base in search. The Acropolis visit becomes then part of a traveling research, as well as a meandering publishing experience. In July 1965, 54 years after his trips and two months before his death, Corbusier would re-edit his manuscript for publication, which materialized a year after he died. The, collect the recollections from the Parthenon were finally fully revealed, both as a posthumous conclusion or a postscript to a life, a form of historiographic apparition that occurs after the author's own death. Revisit. Such a long delay echoes the recollection of another famous visit to the Acropolis, that of the psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud. Freud visited the Parthenon seven years before Corbus in 1904, and in the age of 48, double the age of Jean Heret when the architect visited the monument. But Freud would only write about his visit 32 years later in an open letter to Romain Rolland in the occasion of the author's 70th birthday in 1936, when the psychoanalyst was in fact 80 years old and close to the age that Corbusier would be when he would re-edit his manuscript. Every year in late August or early September, Freud would travel with his brother Alex to the south, mainly Italy. 
But that particular year, Alexander was too busy, and so the trip could only last for one week, which the two brothers planned to spend in the Greek island of Corfu, which they would read, uh, reach after Trieste. But after talking to a local friend in the Italian port, they instead decided to board the next day for a on a steamboat, which would take them uh, through Corfu to Athens, where they could stay for a couple of days. The trip appeared impossible in the beginning. A lot of difficulties seemed insurmountable, writes Freud, which left the psychoanalyst depressed and disconcerted. Nevertheless, the next day, with further thought, Freud was on board of the Urano. Water again. In his letters and postcards to his wife, Freud writes that while traveling through the Gulf of Corinth at night, he would feel the wind animating the sea and via reminiscence from Goethe makes the deck of the ship swell and or appear malicious. Blocks. If Freud experienced a mental or psychological block before embarking on the boat to Athens, Corbusier had to go through another obstruction, cholera and quarantine. A flock of ships ordered by the Greek government blocked Corbus' ship, ship, uh, access, uh, ship access to the port just before it reached the shore of Attica. The vision of the Acropolis had to be suspended, yet all the more intensified, for four more days, which the architects spent in quarantine and in deplorable conditions in the minuscule island of St. George. Stalled movement and nowhere to go as opposed to the limited freedom of the ship deck and the sea journey precede the access of the Acropolis, another form of propylaea framing an entrance. As Freud would outline in his early project for a scientific psychoanalysis, blocks, obstructions, spatial, material, or mental limitations, A, B, and C in this branching diagram, in fact, facilitate instead of limiting the bifurcated pathways of psychological excitation like the flow of the sea, blocks punctuate the itinerary of the journey and keep desire for travel in movement. Corbusier would experience several of these facilitating blocks throughout his long journey, as for example the 24-hour quarantine outside the port of Constantinople, during which he made his many sketches of the city's sky, a line from a distance. The cholera epidemic travels together with the fearless genre, as well as various forms of travel sickness, such as his interminable boots of diarrhea, either because of rotten food of the or the Turkish watermelon, which the architect would later try to block with Greek raisin wine or the Italian macaroni. From the flows of his intestines to the blocks of his boat journey, a supreme law of the meander is being gradually formalized a law that mixes facilitation with obstruction, water flow with the solidity of a rock, as well as the realities of architecture. Even when the young designer finally reaches Athens, there's another block that further delays the fulfillment of his dream visit and prolongs fantasy and foreplay before the actual consummation of the encounter. Jean Heret wanted apparently to see the Acropolis for the first time during sunset. So he invents numerous excuses, excuses to wander around the city and climb on the rock alone later in the afternoon. When he arrives, the site is allegedly deserted. Only four or five apparently foreign visitors are on the site who, like him, would have braved cholera and visited Greece that summer. A sudden whistle blow, the moment the sun disks back, uh, bites the water, interrupts meditation and signals an abrupt exit. The designer then would continue contemplation of the Temple of Victory outside the gate, another restricted access. But for a few hours, it was as if Jean Heret had the monument all for himself. Not so for Freud, for whom the actual building site, while easier in access, keeps eluding him. Like Corbusier, once he arrived to Athens, Freud delayed his ascent to the Acropolis. Quote, Hotel Athen, quite good. We eat there, pension 10 francs then to post where I found nothing, and then the city where I saw a lot. The temple of Theseus, unforgettable, absolutely remarkable, now hungry, end quote. Bodily or biological rhythms intertwine with the passing of the day and contrast with the finality of the building posing as the culmination of a rhythmic sequence. My most beautiful shirt to wear for the visit to the Acropolis, writes Freud in a postcard to his wife, his second day in Athens. Quote, 
We climb around two. It surpasses everything we have seen and anything one can expect, end quote. But the actual experience of the monument, in fact, was certainly not without further obstruction. As Freud attests in his letters, during his visit to the Acropolis, it soon started to rain. And so he and his brother had to take refuge to the courtyard of the Acropolis Museum, obviously the old one, which was next to the temple. Uh, but because it was Sunday, and in Greece we keep that never on Sunday thing, it was, that too was closed. And so he had to start in the courtyard and write the postcard to his wife uh, next to what he calls a horse uh, by uh, the school of Phidias and Alex, my brother, on a marble throne, no doubt, by an ancient archon. It is then doubtful how much Freud actually saw of the Acropolis. Nowhere, either in his letters nor in his later essay, does he actually describe the monument in any detail. It is as if the external world does not really register for the psychoanalyst. Everything becomes a matter of projection. What counts is that the subject is there, standing on the rock, often in the expense or fake ignorance of that architectural object. Quote, so, all these really exist, just as we learned at school, end, end quote. Freud famously recounted, by feigning amazement, Freud, according to the self-analysis performed in his essay, splits into two persons. One that was surprised to see the Acropolis as if it was, quote, the famous Loch Ness monster, end quote, and second, someone who is surprised by one's very doubt whether Acropolis really existed. Space then is introduced as a doubling, spatial and temporal projection caused by on its own incredulity towards an object. Jean Arret, too, had to deal with another form of doubt or incredulity during his first visit to the Acropolis, not whether the Parthenon ever existed, but whether it could maintain its status as an unsurpassable classical ideal. In the earlier part of the trip, he had exalted the vernacular architecture of Turkey and the beauty of the traditional Serbian pots then why would he return to the rules of absolute geometry? And yet, as he at least acknowledged in his later memoir, the monument won him over, instantly in that first visit, which would ensue several revisits. Measurement. Against incredulity and doubt, the young designer employs, employs measurement, the mathematical verification of building. While reminiscing about his visit to the Acropolis in Creation is a Patient Search, Corbusier would instruct the architects, quote, not to believe in anything until they have seen, measured, and touched everything with one's own figures, end quote. Several of the sketches made in situ in Athens and Delphi have extensive measurements, as if attempting to prove a certain hidden formula of composition between the disparity of ruins. While he did carry a camera and took several photographs of buildings and statues, a camera, quote, is a tool for lazy people, said Corbusier, which did not also uh, present, uh, prevent him from using it, yet he is insisting in re-recording everything with his own hands and his own eye. Next to the visual records and measurements, there's also lived experience, which is recovered in writing. Corbusier relays from memory his exact position and itinerary while, while moving through the four main temples of the Acropolis site. We learn then that he enters from the interval from the fourth and the fifth column of the Propylaea, and that he later stands on the highest step of the Parthenon, and that he measures his own height next to the walls of the Erechtheion. Yet, the young traveler also relays the temperature, heat, as well as air and sunlight around the monument to convey the exact atmospheric conditions in which his observations were recorded. Part of this persistent attempt to resuscitate the atmosphere of a visit is also the invocation of tactility, a special yet inextricable part of spatial and bodily vision. Added to Corbusier's order to touch while measuring everything is his testing of the joints of the Parthenon fluted columns with his fingernail in a futile attempt to discover a seam. Quote, the columns of the north facade and the architrave of the Parthenon were still lying on the ground. Touching them with his fingers, caressing them, he grasped the proportions of the design, end quote. Using his fingers or his arms and sometimes his own body, he reconstructs an anthropometric view of building. Leaning against the column with, uh, with his elbow to juxtapose its diameter with his own height or laying flat on his stomach on the floor to corroborate the absolute flatness of the pavement's marble slab were two other strategies for the architectural employment of tactile vision. 
All of this bodily evidence is meant to counteract doubt, the unreality or ideality that would suffuse the building. And yet in his memoir, Jean Arret declares, quote, it would be a beautiful thing if outside reality, these temples, this sea, these mountains, all this stone and water could become only for one hour the creative vision of a heroic mind. What a thing, end quote. Next then to lived or real experience, there's projection. In spite of uh, the habit of measuring, the building's hard facts and the reality testing, everything can instantly turn into a personal vision or advertising extension. If then Corbusier experienced the Acropolis as a heroic self-fulfillment, uh, Freud, on the contrary, had a self-shattering form of confrontation with reality. Quote, what I see here is not real, end quote. Such a sentiment is described by Freud as a feeling of derealization, or even depersonalization, an alienation with the self which leads to the splitting of personality. The feeling of derealization with an object or a place is the opposite of déjà vu or déjà raconte, the illusion of having already visited a place or having already acquired an object that is for the first time encountered. On the contrary, in instances of derealization, the subject strives by all means to keep the object away from her, refusing to acknowledge the presence or disavowing her own existence in the vicinity of the architectural object. Tactility, measuring, and writing are the critical means for overcoming the psychological predicament of derealization in Le Corbusier. Instead of not realizing where it starts, the subject uncores itself and finds its bearing on the side of the building. It leans on it in an illusory propping form or etayage to recover the self even if that ancient building has already fallen. Horizon. In many of his drawings, Corbusier demarcates the line of the horizon, a line tracing the subject's psychological circumference. The horizon is either in front or behind the Acropolis and, inter and it intertwines with the sea. Architecture then consists for Jean Arré of, quote, this ancient dialogue between architect marbles and the horizon of the sea, end quote, material and conceptual traces. The same dialogue expands between the figure of the building and the Penteligos mountain, the very mountain from which the marble stones for the Parthenon were extracted. In the material identification between figure and background, the temple and the mountain, the object, even though a sovereign cube on top of the hill, has only an intermittent presence. As in the caricature drawn by Jean Arès' companion August Klipstein that uh, Beatrice just showed us, on the back of a piece of paper with Greek characters, which I could never decipher exactly what they're saying, and filled with other ornamental scribbles, the Parthenon, with both of its pediments that you see restored, appears as an emanation of the designer's head, like Athena, the temple's goddess sprouting from the head of Zeus, similar to the Kervilinia trace of the cigarette smoking. The upper line of the main frieze coincides with the line of the cigarette, which figures now as a drawing instrument, and then extends further as both sides by the distant coast, uh, coastline. Jeanneret's chest appears to support the pediment, and his coat shares the same direction with the ascending pathway to the temple. The line of the mountain unites with the temple's top and Jeanneret's eyeglasses. Figure is ground then, and subject is both object and landscape. Reality has nothing to do in common with books of instruction, writes famously Corbusier. However, part of that reality recorded in the drawings is informed by a number of books, precisely another printed mementos. The entire setting of the Parthenon as a sovereign cube facing the sea with a horizon line behind it echoes the page spread that you see on top with a panoramic view of Athens in the 1903 Bedeker guidebook on Greece that Jean Arré was carrying with him. Scholars like Giuliano Gressleri have already mentioned reflections of the romantic treatise Pierre sur la Clopole by Ernest Renan in Corbusier's writing about the monument. But among the unpublished note in his carnet from the period he spent in Salonica just before embarking on a boat to Athens, Jean Arré mentions the buying of another book, and that is Alois Riegel's uh, Late Roman Industry, mentioning the price and a number of illustrations, including, quote, splendid color lithographs of antique jewelry that interested the young designer who, as you know, started as a jewelry and clock designer. Regal's book would most probably come as a suggestion by Jean Arès' companion August Klipstein, an art history student interested in the psychological aspects of art and architecture. 
Also known for its theorization of tactility in early art, late Roman industry has a well-known chapter on architecture, which expands from Egypt to the Roman era. And there, Regal presents the pyramids as an autonomous crystalline unit that radiates space upwards, yet has essentially no interior. A similar conceptualization of the pyramid would be echoed by Siegfried Gideon 40 years later in his first of the three conceptions of space, an essentially sculptural or even monolithic conceptualization of architecture, which would expand from the pyramids and obelisks to the Parthenon as autonomous volume radiating space outwards. Based on the same psychological inclination to avoid interior space, Regal would read the forest of giant columns in hypostyle temples such as Luxor and Karnak as another strategy for essentially annihilating space. In Corbusier's drawings, the screen of columns from the Propylaea or the Parthenon do not annihilate, but I would argue frame and demarcate space. Similar to Darclos and Appiah's columns of the 1909 rhythmic spaces, they juxtapose spatial presence with historical absence as they alternate between light and shadow, close and far vision. Corbusier's own approach oscillates between haptic and optic perception, as well as close and far viewing. The entire trip is in fact suspended between history and historiography. It is now historiography that precedes the writing of history and the documentation of its psychological laws. Last page, the limit. Intrinsic in both Freud and Corbusier's travel is the notion of the limit. Freud attributed his ambivalence towards the Acropolis to his own guilt for having traveled too far, for daring to reach a destination that his father would never even have dreamed of reaching. Jeanneret's silence towards his parents the entire period he was in Athens might divulge a similar remorse, yet for the young designer, the Acropolis sets another limit which cannot be transgressed. The visit to the Acropolis is the apogee or culmination of a journey. After that, there's only return. Flipping through thousands of photographs arranged in folders in the Archaeological Institute in Athens, he sees a picture of the three pyramids. And there, he decides not to visit them or continue the journey to the south. My mind is made up, says Corbusier. I shall see neither the Mosque of Omar nor the pyramids, end quote. Corbusier would, in fact, see the pyramid, not in Egypt, but in Italy, after he saw it projected on Mount Athos, when he saw the pyramid of Caius Sestus in Rome next to Adrian's tomb. Death. And yet, I write with eyes that have seen the Parthenon and have seen it with joy, concludes Corbusier. Such joy was not always there. As recorded in his manuscript notes in one of his final days in Athens, while looking at the Acropolis from the hill of Lycabedus, he sees a gigantic carcass traveling down the hill to Piraeus. He can no longer bear to look at the monument, and he confesses that when he looks at it, it looks like a corpse. The trip to the Acropolis is over, and yet the previously static monument has become a trip in and of itself. The building of the Parthenon performs its own procession, backwards, rolling down the hill towards the port from which the traveler previously ascended. In his final notes of the Athens scene, jean feels again sick and, quote, alone like a cow, a clipstein had left. He sees a funereal procession with priests and an open coffin with flies and a green face. The formerly animated Parthenon now becomes part of that funereal procession. The admiration, or even adoration, of the first shock is then succeeded by hostility and revulsion against the building which turns more and more deadly. As in Appiah's rhythmic spaces, the monument turns from light to dark, flickering with ambivalence. As in Freud's bewildering experience, the building becomes the place of uncanny anxiety, the splitting of the personality or the ego, and the locus of derealization. Postscript. The final travel plan was the architect's own end, quote, dying while swimming towards the sun, which would occur in the course of Cap Martin in the final days of August 1965. During his obituary address in Corbusier's funeral at the Grand Court of the Louvre, Adrien Malraux, then Minister of Culture, announced that among the material tributes to the architect, a representative from India would pour water from the Ganges over the architect's remains, and that a Greek dignitary would deposit a portion of earth from the Acropolis inside the architect's grave. Uh, it was as if then part of the building site had traveled to meet the architect, and yet, even though we, like him, will never know whether they ever arrived, these remnants to greet us, uh, we will uh, never uh, 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 sort of uh, 
create or recreate and know if they actually these remains did finally arrive. So thank you. And to tie the knot to this travel, traveling of today, uh, we have uh, Kenneth Frampton, the were professor of architecture here at Columbia, and he will deliver a paper called Lucky This Point, my time at A.B. Good afternoon. Well, I get to say this is a rather solipsistic presentation since it's largely about my own travels, or rather, I should say, my non-travels in a literal sense, within and without London. So all of this is impossibly personal and somewhat inadequate at the same time. This is the first time I've attempted to give this account in public, and so there are many holes for which I apologize in advance. It would take too long and be too much of an indulgence to fill in uh, to cross all the T's and to dot all the I's, etc., etc. I do indeed have a few visuals, much against the worst fears of some of my colleagues, and <clears throat> but they are thin on the ground when compared to the previous presentations you have heard. It may perhaps be more colourful in a certain sense, perhaps too colourful, like the, the cover of AD that you're looking at here, which isn't actually the first edition of the magazine with which I was involved, but nonetheless one which I have a certain affection, Rouge et Noir, and of course, Rouge et Noir, Switzerland. <clears throat> the title of this uh, presentation is taken in part from a poem by Auden that carries the line, lucky this point in time and space is chosen as my working place. <clears throat> and while the place in question was not the rural, idyllic English countryside evoked by Auden, it was nonetheless fortunate I consider myself to have been very fortunate to have found myself in this position uh, in, in the last two years, really, of the time that I sort of spent uh, living more or less permanently in England. <coughs> Located in the centre of London, close to Hawksmoor St. George's Bloomsbury Church, where from July 1962 to January 65, I served as technical editor <coughs> with the editor, Monica Pigeon, of the British magazine, The Architectural Design, and where the journeys in question were mainly voyages that were enriching to the mind and the spirit, while for the most part, I remained rooted uh, to my seat, uh, where we worked together in a rather dank basement for the Standard Catalog Company, engaged in the production of a monthly journal on architecture, which had already existed for quite a while. In fact, Monica had taken over this uh, the editorship of this paper <coughs> with the outbreak of the Second World War when the, the editor, a certain Mr. Toundro, had to join the armed forces and go out of the country. And she would keep that position for, for the best part of her life. <coughs> when I say we, and I think I did say we, <coughs> I am alluding to four people. John Brooks, who was then you know, a struggling landscape architect and is now some kind of Eminence Gris in the British landscape profession, with a very small practice, working part-time. Veronica Bennett, who was a young graduate from Oxford and uh, still very uncertain about what she wanted to do with her life. <coughs> and Monica, who died a month ago in Highgate at the age of 96, still talking about recovering from a uh, minor operation she was supposed to have, you know, but she never did recover. <coughs> and myself. And where, uh, where John uh, Brooks and Veronica Bennett came into the office at around 10 o'clock, more or less, Monica and I arrived after lunch and worked to around 7 in the evening. A team uh, of, not a gang of four, but a team of four, uh, not all of whom worked full time, as I've already said, produced a monthly journal without any problems, so that I cannot say how shocked I was when I first came to the States and found monthly architectural journals with editorial staffs running to, from around you know, 15 to 20 people. I couldn't understand why they needed all these people to produce these, 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 these monthly journals. I should, probably, the, despite the recession, the figures are still much bigger than four. 
<coughs> Admittedly, we had the advantage that the Standard Catalog Company owned a printing house, the Whitefriars Press, so that we could make last minute modifications to the text and the layout without incurring serious economic penalties for having done so. The other big advantage was that the advertising was held, handled by a totally other office, so we didn't have to deal with that. <clears throat> All of this amounted to a journey for me uh, in as much as I was constantly exposed to people and material that I would not have experienced in the same way with the same intensity had I not been responsible for effectively guiding, if not exactly controlling, the content of the magazine for just over two intense years. For while Monica ultimately had the last word, since she was the editor, uh, in any conflict between us, and believe you me, there were a few conflicts, um, she once described me, described me as the most neurotic thing she'd ever met, uh, uh, for the most part, I was at liberty to determine the interpretive line of the journal as I saw fit. While this position quite literally entailed a certain amount of traveling, above all to France, Germany, Italy, Switzerland, and Greece, it also brought me into contact with developments and with figures who, would, who I would otherwise have been unaware of. It was a kind of built-in antidote to the endemic British provincialism, which was still very much around. This was pre Arvind Boyarsky and uh, the AA. <clears throat> when I cast my mind back as to who these figures were and the mise en scene of my encounters with them, both during and after this two year period, I still remain astonished at the diversity and range of these episodes, so much so that, with regard to what is presumably the general intention of this event, I thought I might gather together a series of vignettes that, as a mosaic, <clears throat> Um, influenced and still influences my way of looking at the world in one degree or another. So here they are jumbled together in a all but sequential order, a set of, from my point of view, cherished Proustian episodes, unduly compressed, that serve to tie me back to a moment in history, in my own history of course, in the 60s, the beginning of the 60s, that was both my time and yet in some sense also before my time. And I think that, that, that this, when I look back at this experience, the way in which you know, any of us in any one moment in time are also linked to other moments in time, um, the overlapping uh, generations and moments in time. The first number of which I had you know, control, well not quite the first, but close to the first, was an issue on Switzerland, which I'm showing here, dated September 1962, featuring among, uh, this is a house by somebody named Brera in Geneva, or near Geneva, featuring among the work of other prominent Swiss architects, now in many instances forgotten, such figures and items as the earliest works of the uh, Atelier Five, uh, um, houses in Flamat and in Mottier, uh, completed prior to the realization of the Siedlung Harlan, uh, which we would also eventually publish at the beginning of 65, with a seminal critical essay by Neve Brown. In fact, I think I was, to a greater extent than Theo Crosby, able to introduce uh, critical texts into this magazine. Uh, I'm not saying that he didn't uh, uh, introduce any, but I kind of went out of my way to, to, to do that. And, I, and it's a convenient moment in which I, I should say, you know, that I am greatly indebted to Theo Crosby for having uh, sort of somehow happened upon me as his successor. And just to complete the story, although it cannot be finally completed, this, my successor was Robin Middleton. And so the incestuous link between the South African recommending a Brit and a Brit, well, uh, leaving and not actually recommending anybody, and uh, Crosby again recommending a South African, you know, having. <laughs> the Brit having departed uh, all too promptly. But in this issue of uh, dealing with, and, I, I, and I've sort of indulged in looking back at these journals, dealing with the Swiss architecture at this time was an absolutely astonishing building which is still in Zurich, which is, I believe, still intact, called Zur Palme, which was a 12-story office building, extremely ingenious design by one Andre Studer, who had come from working with uh, Bodiansky in Morocco in Abbat Afrik back to Zurich, he was Swiss. And, uh, and I'm left asking the question as I, 
mention this person. And here, of course, I should have an illustration, and I don't have for the building, so you're just going to have to take my word for it. Um, you know, it is somebody that I, I'm left asking the question, you know, whatever happened to Andre Studa? You know, I, uh, I, I remember this remarkable building, but I don't know of any other that would, would follow it. And, um, but there were others who, who were equally prominent at this time. One, for example, Ernst Giesel, who built a lot in and around Zurich churches, apartment buildings, etc. One, Dolph Schneebly, who built an amazing kind of uh, takeoff of the Maison Jaul in uh, Campo d'Italia in uh, the Ticino. Happily, Moses Steiger, of course, who had been the architects of record for the Studa, Zur Palme, in any case. Um, uh, and uh, and these, uh, the, the ingenious Marc Sauget, a uh, largely uh, forgotten architect of Geneva, who was probably one of the most amazing planners of, of mixed-use commercial space on narrow, tight urban sites I've ever encountered. And then, you know, at the end, because it was the habit of uh, AD to mix art and architecture together, a documentation for which I was largely responsible of the Swiss concrete painter, Richard Loza. We... Um, we followed this in October um, 62 with a modernized version of the Vitruvian Man on the cover designed by me as a kind of trademark with a documentation of Mises' latest pieces projected for Iowa and Mexico City plus a glimpse of Sterling's Leicester Engineering Building under construction and a feature focused on the genealogy of Richard Hamilton's montage stroke painting entitled She. And... Um, so in, in the space of a month, you know, I could pass, so to speak, as far as my taste was concerned, from the art concrete painting uh, of a very musical nature by Loza to the proto-pop art work of Hamilton, both being for me then as now equally beautiful and of relevance to architecture. And incidentally, of course, I, I worked, was to meet, had the privilege of meeting both Loza and Hamilton and learning from Hamilton in his studio of the merits of the um, little-known furniture designed by the American automobile designer Harvey Earl. Uh, I mean, if anyone was kind of uh, obsessed with America, it was certainly Hamilton. In November 62 uh, came an issue uh, devoted to British building and above all to two salient uh, 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 achievements, namely uh, blocky brick-faced neo carnian um, courtyard building known as Keyes College, Cambridge, designed by Leslie Martin and to some extent by Colin St. John Wilson, but in the end, I think, by the backroom boy of the team, Patrick Hodgkinson, who had been a classmate of mine at the AA, extremely talented, someone who had spent a year in Alto's office in Helsinki before finishing his studies at the AA. And the other building which was, uh, accompanies this is James Cadbury Brown's Royal College of Art, which was very much with many allusions to Macintosh's Glasgow School of Art, rather kind of clumsy allusions for that matter, on Kensington Gore opposite the Albert Memorial. This issue carried the second seminal piece uh, uh, to be written by Alan Cahoon, Se second seminal piece of criticism to be written by Al Alan Cahoon, uh, <coughs> the first piece being his critique of Rainer Bannum's theory and design of the First Machine Age, published in 1962, and published first in the British Journal of Aesthetics. This essay bore the title Symbolic and Literal Aspects of Technology in which he continued the ideolo ideological altercation, so to speak, with Bannum, which, was, which he first broached broke in, in the British Journal of Aesthetics. I attached at the end of, an, of the issue a pan-European AA student project for a regionally scaled linear city taking off from Arthur Korn's Mars Plan for London of 1938 under the title Euroway. We also, we also featured a, a, a long essay on, by me on the 76-year-old Georges Van Tongelou in this issue, and I had the privilege of going to Paris and digging the Tongelou out in his studio in the Lesse uh, in Paris and uh, near the Metro Lesse. And uh, that was a kind of memorable moment, a kind of science fiction uh, diminutive with a, a figure, you know, surrounded by plastic constructions, multicolored plastic constructions, uh, on which he expounded at length. 
He had, uh, the occasion for this was, in fact, he had an exhibition in the, the New London Gallery in London. Uh, it is also the occasion that his, that his works uh, come under the control of Max Bill, who was the executor of his, um, of his will. We also published Scarpa's Gavina store in Bologna on this occasion. Um, May 63 featured a decidedly garish cover by me, uh, and one more note in passing that for better or for worse, I had the privilege which I inherited from Crosby of designing all the covers. Uh, and Middleton didn't avail himself of this uh, dubious privilege. Uh, with this, we turned our attention to uh, the new town centre of Cumbernaud, also in Beton Brut, and then under construction near Glasgow in Scotland by Geoffrey Copcut, uh, working under the leadership of Al Hugh Wilson, who was actually the the architect of the city, <clears throat> the plan being featured on this cover. I mean, you know, it was a, it was a center, a kind of brutalist center that was completely divorced by the little house, from the little houses by which it was, it was surrounded. This same issue carried a seminal theoretical essay by Cedric Price, I think one of his earliest. The issue of June 63 will see us turning our attention to Germany and to the truly remarkable Neckermann mail order plant, not shown here, built in Frankfurt to the designs of Egon Eiermann and to Sharoon's Romeo and Juliet apartment buildings in Stuttgart, as well as to his project for the Berlin Philharmonie that was then under construction. On completing this issue, I will have the privilege of traveling with Monica to Germany to see much of this work for myself, including an ever memorable visit to Berlin where we were shown the sights at high speed in a battered Citroen, driven by Georg Heinrichs, of the firm Dutmann Heinrichs Muller, uh, as we paused before buildings, uh, before one building after another, before be, being taken to the plane, uh, Heinrichs would enter into the litany, Bitterschand, Dankeschau, Auf Wiedersehen, and then we would go off to the next. This, the rather dull cover of this issue carried an image of Schneider Esleben's brilliant, in my view, Phoenix Rheinrohr slab a high-rise, high-tech excursus transcending the American work of Mies, in a way, or certainly departing from it, which would take a long time for the British high-tech to come close to this kind of technological prowess. We also visited the Hochschule of Gestaltung in Ulm on this occasion, and so this enabled me for the first time to meet Thomas Maldonado, whom I would later have more uh, uh, connections with in Princeton, and uh, Claude Schneid, who as far as I know never came to the States, such were his, were, such was his, his extremely left political uh, view of the world. And um, it's Schneid, of course, who, who publishes the book uh, uh, on Hannes Meyer buildings, writings, projects. In much the same vein, in November 63, uh, I will push the magazine into a kind of proto high tech issue with a uh, and the cover on this occasion is an inside-out kind of cutaway, as it were, of the space of the Eiffel Tower drawn by me. This issue would take me to Zurich to meet Max Bill and Margit Staber in the Congress House in Zurich in order to gain permission to publish his remarkably elegant pavilion, a uh, prefabricated pavilion, um, actually that paid a kind of diminutive homage to the Crystal Palace 1851, designed for the Schweizerisch Landhaus of 1963, as mounted on the shores of Lac de Main in Lausanne of that year. The same issue would carry a long pioneering article by one Conrad Roland Lehmann on multi-story suspension structures, and virtually the first publication in English of Jonah Friedman's Paris Spatial proposal for the French capital. My close friendship with Friedman will date from this time as does my initial contact with the Dutch concrete artist Jus Ballieu who also contributed to this issue. So uh, I, I was constantly connected to both, um, to constructivist artists in England and in the Netherlands and elsewhere. <coughs> January 64 will be an omnibus issue which, in which we will assemble a lot of pending, um, virtually random material as Monica insisted on doing from time to time. I mean, the, the game in this magazine, and I'm sure it was the case in other magazines that Architects would send projects to the magazine and there would be kind of friendly correspondence but no commitment. And after a while, Monica would feel the pressure of this kind of, of all this stuff stacking up. 
and we would have to sort of do an omnibus issue. Even so, I managed to emphasize the most recent production of the Mies office in Chicago, the very elegant but largely forgotten Charles Center in Baltimore, which is kind of diminutive mini Seagram, and along with the Federal Center in Chicago and the Neue National Gallery in Berlin, which was then just a project. But as the rather corny flags on the cover would suggest, there was work from many other venues, including Mexico, Sweden, the Netherlands, Japan, Israel. One of the most surprising works of this collection was the heroic reinforced concrete tower and pier in Schkevingen, designed by Van Tyen and Maskan, jutting out into the North Sea in total defiance of the context, more often than not windy and highly inclement. I recall visiting it at night in the early evening on a Sunday. It was packed with cigar smoking Dutch, prosperous Dutch men with their wives, uh, and, and they were kind of dressed, as it were, with uh, serried international flags, like the cover of this, this, this issue, you know, as we find it, as we find such flags stacked in Rockefeller Center. I, I found the whole thing totally surprising, extremely heroic, extremely refreshing from an English point of view, at least. The same issue carried a very sophisticated project for a large sector of Berlin, designed again by Duttmann, Heinrichs, and Muller, so-called Märkischersviertel, I'm not showing it here, laid out as though it were a self-contained town in itself, an organic, all but alto solution that unfortunately would not be built. Nothing could be further from this than Leopold Gerstel's inhabitable pyramid projected for the Israeli desert. I've gone ahead of myself, I can see. This is, um, hence the Israeli flag, a Babylonian proposition that in many respects anticipated Moshe Safdie's habitat built in Montreal in 1967. A large part of the February 64 issue was devoted to a full coverage of Sterling and Gowan's Leicester Engineering Building, as the cover would indicate, a number which would carry a critical essay by me of the, about the building, the first of three building evaluations that I would be able to write while I was there, the other two being a review of Sharoon's Philomonie and, and of Smithson's uh, economist building in St. James's in London, which also I managed to publish before leaving. <clears throat> I, I perhaps should say at this juncture that, that the magazine that I was constantly trying to emulate and couldn't come um, even close to it was, of course, Ernesto Rogers' Casabella with its very strong thematic drive and, and, uh, and with, you know, with this heavy use of fold-outs. I mean, I, I introduced fold-outs into AD at this time very expensive. They were dropped soon after I left, I think. One should note in passing that AD was almost a direct outlet for the work of the Smithsons and had been so well before my time, dating back to Theo Crosby's initiation as technical editor of the magazine in the early 50s, hence a special issue of the Team 10 Primer that came out just prior to my joining the editorial. My preoccupation with trying to achieve special thematic issues with each number of the magazine led to combinatory numbers in which the journal would concentrate on two distinct architectural practices at the same time, as in this issue, March 1964, when the focus was on Italy and divided between the practice of Mangiarotti and Morosuti in Milano and that of Gino Valli and Udini, the latter being a resume of the, resume of the work of Valli under the curatorship of Joseph Rickwert. In a similar la fashion, the issue of May 64 will be split between a reportage on Basilia, which you see at the bottom plan, and the documentation of the work of Aris Constantinidis. I had met, uh, uh, well, I'd become aware of Constantinidis, and I'd met Constantinidis uh, by virtue of my Greek Cypriot friend who was then uh, uh, practicing in Athens, Panos Kulamos, and uh, um, and I suppose it's a moment in which I, would, I ought to concede that my preoccupation with critical regionalism, which had yet to be given a name by Alex Zonis and Leander Fevre in 81, uh, has its origins, I suppose, right here in my focus on small rooted architectural practices in what I fondly conceived of as European city-states, as opposed to the rather decadent um, unprepossessing uh, city-states that obtained in the United Kingdom, such as, you know, Ernst Giesel in Zurich, Aris Constantinides in Athens, Matthias Ungers in Cologne, and so on.
Number 10 of, no, number nine, wrong about that. Of, uh, um, no, number 10, I've got, the, I've got these images, I think. No, start again. The very next issue, so I'm right, nine, will be devoted to a block of apartments in Leinster Square, Bayswater, London, which I had had the luck, again, lucky this point in time and space, to design from stem to stern, so to speak, in the office of Douglas Stephen and Partners, a building which is now, God knows why, a grade two historic monument, which is more or less what I am, I think. And a, a building that was sort of infamous for its scissors section, and uh, shown here in a very abstract way, <coughs> in which, of course, you, you either went into a down-going apartment or an up-going apartment, and if you went into a down-going apartment, you would go down half a level to the living, dining, kitchen, and half another level down to bathroom, and yet another half level down to the bedrooms, and vice versa with the up-going. Uh, it's an ingenious device that has not actually been invent invented by B, but by some <coughs> intellectual fanatic in the London County Council Architects Department, and, but it was, I think it's the only occasion that anyone has been foolish enough to have built this, you know. Uh, um, I mean, the big advantage was, and of course, it's, it's, it was built for a developer, since all of Douglas's clients were developers, is that one could get more units on the site that were with favorable or east-west orientations than one could with any other uh, sectional solution. So that's why, of course, this, this kind of preposterous section was, was allowed to go forward um, and, I, and, and this is the building on the outside and, and uh, I mean what was, what was particularly fortunate and particularly intense was that I spent my mornings supervising the construction of this building and uh, hurriedly uh, you know supplying a few details which had not yet been worked out and I went in the afternoons to architectural design so I sort of had this kind of schizophrenic Persona, which has never really left me, of, you know, on the one hand, uh, being engaged in practice, which I have not been, of course, in, in of, of recent date, but, you know, in any case, divided between two poles. I, I should say one word about Douglas Stephen, who was an astonishing person, and who, in fact, uh, God knows why, gave to young people, you know, uh, the opportunity to design buildings from scratch, and he almost... Uh, well, provided very minimal supervision over these uh, these enterprises. <clears throat> and then October 64, this is the number 10, which was devoted to Tokyo and to the Japanese metabolists under the guest editorship of Gunter Nitschke. I should then, I suppose, explain that Gunter Nitschke was <clears throat> a colleague of mine who, um, um, during before this issue, in fact, had received a, um, um, a scholarship from the German government to, to, to go to Japan and, and study in Tokyo for a year, and this was a journey from which he never returned. I mean, he, he's lived in Japan ever since. And this uh, particular issue features, of course, Noriaki Kurokawa, um, it, when he was still called Noriaki Kurokawa, on the cover, a typically metabolist high-rise project, Kenzo Tangi's Tokyo Bay of 1960, Kiramori Kikutaki's uh, projects for buildings that are sort of half submerged in the sea, and above all, a, a small coverage of Na Naburu Kawazoe, who was really the literary and artistic kind of founder of the metabolism movement, and uh, so all of this was, was, as it were, exposed by Nitschke. And Nitschke would go on, well, including this, to edit two other issues of the magazine. Well, he had done one before on Tokyo Master Plan, and he would do one later, after I left AD, with a, with a remarkable title, Shimi, Binding and Unbinding, which was um, really a, a piece of res research, amongst other things, into Japanese Shinto agricultural renewal rights, and, uh, um, and would form the basis for something that he has always uh, has spent his heart his entire life since trying to consolidate, but has only, I think, been able to on a very modest scale, which is a kind of uh, center, of, uh, uh, center for, the, uh, uh, for the anthropological study of, of building culture, basically. <clears throat> if truth were told, uh, 
I was always affected and influenced by my closest colleagues, figures like Alan Cahoon, Peter Eisman, uh, Peter Eisman, who you know, was basically responsible for bringing me to this country, and Peter Eisman, who's the, the, who wrote this, uh, we published the first extract of his doctoral thesis in Cambridge University in England in AD during my time there. Uh, the Greek, uh, uh, Cypriot, Paulos Columbus, to whom I've al already mentioned and with whom I worked in Douglas Stephen and Partners, uh, Michael Karapetian, architect, photographer, with whom I collaborated on, and with Douglas Stephen on the book British Building. It was Columbus, in fact, who, um, it was with, well, Columbus was the guest editor of a special issue dealing with the works very early, in fact, beyond, before Zevi's uh, Omaggio a Tirani. Uh, you know, it was dedicated to the works of Tirani and Jerry. And um, I suppose uh, I, I ought to mention other kind of, um, for me, you know, seminal encounters, like publishing the last Unité d'Habitation, the, the very, uh, dimin you know, um, over-restricted, over over over-reduced Brier en Forêt Unité d'Habitation de Le Corbusier, and going, in fact, to the the studio in Rue de Sèvres to pick up the material and having the privilege of meeting him in person. And I have to say, contrary to what may be others' experience of him, it was actually the second time I met him that uh, he was incredibly charming and modest and self-deprecating, I would say, and, and somewhat depressed by, by, not at the thought of publishing the Unité, but uh, at the the degree to which the unité had been cut down to size by the French bureaucracy, he said, you know, it's like um, a child that has grown out of his clothes. But there were other encounters like with Bucky Fuller, who was um, a long-standing, uh, you know, had, had, had long since been uh, um, connected to architectural design long before I was involved with the magazine. And uh, largely through John McHale, and uh, I, there, there's one particular occasion which, which uh, has um, left an indelible uh, memory, uh, which is Fuller coming to the offices of architectural design after having given a lecture at uh, London University <coughs> and in a state of distress, uh, having been challenged by a British student about the politics implicit in his uh, technological inventions, which he was not used to since he was much more honored in England uh, by people like Norman Foster and Cedric Price, Arthur Graham, et cetera, than he was in the United States. So England had always been you know, uh, a place where he could sort of uh, land, so to speak, and feel totally lauded and talk for hours, of course. And uh, um, some kid had obviously uh, um, challenged him. And so he... He was absolutely rattled by this, and uh, and he couldn't he couldn't really get it out of his mind. And we took him to dinner, and afterwards, when we took him back to his hotel with his wife, saying um, good night to him, basically, he actually uttered the following words, which were never. He said, "I don't know what the dear Lord is trying to tell me by this." This is what Fuller what said as his parting shot on that particular occasion. The end of my time in AD coincides with my beginning of my time in the States, and um, there are two successive scenes in this regard with which I will leave you. The, the first is that I was invited to the States for a weekend, and I was um, met you know, at Newark Airport by none other than Emilio Ambas, an Argentine immigre student at Princeton, a kind of wunderkind who would go from graduating uh, he was in his final year at that time, graduating uh, with an M arch to, to, um, to becoming a member of the faculty overnight. And um, so it is he who drove me from Newark Airport down to the Lowry House in Princeton, where there was the first of these case meetings organized by Peter Eisman. <coughs> and, um, and on this occasion, which, in, which included all these kind of... Uh, the usual suspects, as they then were. Now, I say we could say not all the usual suspects have, have survived to this date, but you know the five architects, of course, and uh, the Venturi and uh, uh, Tim Freeland, 
um, Coterie from Philadelphia, and of course Scully from Yale, and uh, Henry Millen and Stanford Ennis from MIT, etc., etc. In this kind of somewhat lugubrious guest house of Princeton University, which I still, which I believe still serves the same function, and um, it so happens that the first night I slept in the United States, I shared a bedroom with Richard Meyer, uh, with, uh, with you know, surrounded by Chinese jars, with Richard Meyer in one uh, uh, four-poster bed and myself in the other. I think we kept it that way. But of course, you know, it was the beginning of a relationship from which I have never really recovered. Thank you. So this was a long trip. We went for um, a long flight. Um, and uh, there are many different things that were said. Uh, I um, would like to, to propose a couple of uh, words uh, that strike me in each one of uh, your presentations. Uh, for Felicity, the, 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 the word home, the, the, the idea of shoe, <coughs> the shoe, or the food, the food without the shoe. Um, for Ruben, the idea of the sketch, the sketch as a trace of the trip. Um, for, for Mark, obviously the idea of local and the idea of trying to uh, make the local uh, stand, even though it may not even exist. Mm -hmm. uh, for Beatrice, the idea of the 747, and the, the 747 describes as an edifice when it's, mm -hmm. it's really an object, no? Or, or mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a really, uh, can it be really, really talked as an edifice or, or as a building? Um, um, for Spiros, the idea of block and flow, uh, in, ar in the architectural sense, but also in the bodily sense and how they intertwine in Freud and, and Le Corbusier. And for, for Ken, the idea of being a Brit and being described by others as a Brit and, being, and ending the conversation as the Brit that came, that came for a weekend yeah. to the US <laughs> and was greeted by an Argentinian. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, if you could tell more about any of those words. Starting with Felicity. Oh, starting with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, with home actually, it was really interesting that um, uh, Ruben showed the only home Radovsky ever built for himself. Uh, immediately after, which was uh, many decades later, and of course reiterated the trope of the, uh, of the courthouse, you know, toward the end of his life. And um, it's actually a remarkable house if you've been there. But what I was thinking that is that when you mentioned the house and the shoe, I mean, this is you know exactly mm. one aspect of what I was trying to to get at to to really take the uh, foot fetishism, you know seriously um, to uh, expand that into what I've been trying to cast as a sort of territorial fetishism that elsewhere I've been trying to formulate <coughs> as the figure of a sort of circulating specificity, a sort of uh, paradoxical idea um, about how you know, figures of exchange and circulation and, and certainly um, uh, of, of sort of economics of Radovsky's uh, 
experience of this crisis of moving into um, uh, America and later into what he uh, experiences and actually articulates as uh, figures of globalization, how these meet, you know, at quite paradoxically the most specific <laughs> and uh, bizarre type of intimacy yeah, and then the house, the house um, which does become a home, although this will also be something that Rodowski tropes on uh, the distinctions between the house and home and the degree to which um, the house could even, um, you know, possibly uh, become a home suddenly in the U.S. This is, again, one of his uh, uh, key questions. But anyway, you've got exactly the nexus that I'm looking at of the, uh, of the, the shoe or the foot or the, the, the shoe that has, um, uh, I didn't show, but Rudowski at one point actually when he's being interviewed um, in the 1940s having just put on the Art Clothes Modern Exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art is, is described um, by his interviewer, and this is for like, a major New York publication, I think it's Time Magazine, as, as um, looking like your regular sort of Madison Avenue businessman uh, until you see his feet. And he had uh, felt slippers, as it was described. And so <laughs> this like strange sense in which even when he uh, takes on the appearance of a, um, a, a New York character, you know, will still be sort of marked by, um, by the foot, yeah? I mean, it's a very mm -hmm. unusual, uh, peculiar trope. Uh, yeah, and the, the shoe being like, in many cases, the image of discomfort rather than comfort, Correct, the kind of yeah. mm -hmm. the apparatus that makes it possible to be in the city, but not necessarily in comfort. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah definitely. And the tie, mm -hmm. you know, I'm thinking about the suit and the tie and mm -hmm. the, the way Woodson portrays himself so comfortably, <coughs> in so tan, so healthy, um, <laughs> so foreign <laughs> in the same way, so, um, you know, this, the sense of a traveler from the Nordic countries going to the southern sun and mm. taking full advantage of it. Mm. Mm. Well, yeah, his his um, his uh, suit um, perhaps f has the same function as the platforms that he's promoting. So um, he's wanting to argue; it does argue that the platforms enable the dream. Um, so the platforms have to be embedded, so he starts to call them plateaus, as if they haven't been introduced, but are, are just a kind of a rounding of the terrain. But he distinguishes between the two. Yeah, but he moves... I mean, two different cultures, basically. Yeah, but he moves mm -hmm. towards yeah. the plateau. Yeah. As the sort of honoured, mm -hmm. seems to me, the honour term. And his suit there has the same sort of function, because we know during the time in which he seems so relaxed in that suit, he's absolutely traumatized and is subject to endless legal, uh, technical constraints. In fact, from the very beginning of the contract with Over Arab, th there is a kind of a warfare begins. Um, so, this, the, so the sort of suit has this function of holding him together through that. And, and you notice that he takes it off only with the, with the partial success of the, of the spherical geometry moves into this black phase, and then, of course, it immediately gives way again. <coughs> why, do, why do you think he was so challenged? Why, why do, did it, the culture challenge him so much, rather than support him in making this amazing building? Why the challenge? Um, well, there were so many reasons. I, I, even in the very first announcements, uh, it was described as a controversial design, because even Saarinen said, this will be controversial. So he sort of said, this is the best one, and it's so good it will be controversial. So the sort of scene was set for the Australians to reject the project. Um, and from the, da the very day that he was announced as a winner, s a team of local architects Lo I, I think has to do formed, with that. A kind of formed a, c a committee that took every opportunity for the next five years to identify the fact that this person was too young, too beautiful, too everything. And too foreign, uh, because yeah. I, I think if if Australia would have been a bit more hospitable mm. to Woodson, many of us would have gone to Australia. I mean, I, I think Australia could have emerged as United States, mm. at least mm. for the ones that are in the southern mm. hemisphere. But mm. uh, somehow there was something um, not hospitable about the way the foreigner or the non-local mm. was um, helped. 
mm -hmm. to not do his feeling the way uh, he, he was dreaming. Mm -hmm. Arab has very nice things to say, however, you know, oh, uh, mm -hmm. because uh, he recognizes that that was a very difficult thing to build. Mm -hmm. And he, 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 he says, you know, it would have been better because uh, of the enormous stress that each of his shells put onto these points when they come down to the podium. And, uh, but then he says, you know, that, uh, I mean, it would have been easier to do it in steel. You know. But um, he recognized that Utsun was, you know, wanted a particular uh, form, and, and, and he, is, he is kind of respectful, because, you know, Arab himself, you know, with regard to that, that will to form that, uh, that Utsun manifests. You know. But, for example, when you compare the trips to, of Le Corbusier to India, mm -hmm. the 24 trips over <laughs> two years, <laughs> <laughs> um, and and how he managed to do uh, a building there mm -hmm. w uh, with incredible support, a very difficult building to build, mm -hmm. equally diff mm -hmm. difficult to Woodson because that yeah, the shells were difficult, but yeah. no, di no more difficult than yeah. than many buildings built abroad. And I and I think the the attitude towards mm -hmm. that person. Mm -hmm. Uh, the architect coming from another land was very different in India, and maybe the embrace that the Corbusier that you show today of Air India and com and comparing and talking of India always mm -hmm. favorably helped the, the mission. Sure, but it cannot have been just that because I mean that's in his sketchbooks, and I mean he may have expressed also his admiration for Air India, but, that, but I mean I think what he did, which is to put Pierre there, Pierre Jarret is there from the beginning, and he stays there for the duration, right? I mean, he, he basically came back to Paris to die. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think in many ways, uh, you cannot talk about the, the Le Corbusier without this partnership. It's probably the most important, the most uh, mm -hmm. significant partnership of, of the center and the more uh, unstudied. We don't know anything, anything about Pierre, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, but he was absolutely crucial. I mean, the Smithsons have a very beautiful thing that they wrote on the on the death of uh, Janet, and, and you can only find few things here, and then look how short he was, for example. Have you ever seen no. him? No. He's very short. I mean, really <laughs> like I mean, you know, feet. but I'm saying, no. exactly. So we don't have even a picture of, of what the man looked like, right? So that was very crucial, that there was Pierre there the whole time, right? And, uh, and of course, there were all these mostly very, very young uh, Indian architects, including the... Dosti uh, or Prakash, the father of Vikram uh, uh, Prakash, uh, was a very, very young architect who was uh, already on his way to the UK when uh, he was uh, uh, called to, and then they returned. He, I mean, several of that generation of architects came back uh, to India precisely to work on the so, I mean, of course, we, you brought the question of the local. You cannot talk about the global without talking about the local, and there are many, many things that are uh, very interesting at, uh, uh, in that aspect, even what you were talking about before, the resentment always mm -hmm. of the, um, towards the foreign architect. You cannot, you, you know, I just went, I just was in Rome, no? And so the, there's still the Italians about whether Fafati should have or not have done that, that building. You know, it's always this, this, this question. And also the question of the split, the, uh, which is much more contemporary between the so-called design architect and the, and, the, and the building architect, basically. And it's, it's usually this split is becoming more, it's, it's, it's actually more, mostly the local and the, and the, and the, and the global. And the global. the global getting the whole kind of recognition international, the mm -hmm. signature architect. And in that split, we have a profound trans transformation of the profession of uh, architecture in the post-war uh, mm -hmm. years, which the Corbusier really didn't have to deal with so much. But, but it's not like you know, it's not like we invented global architecture in the last century. You know, mm -hmm. all the cities in um, from Washington D.C. to Buenos Aires have been built with foreigners. Yes, yes. But somehow, this th what you are saying is that this kind of divide, now it's totally instrumentalized. It's not, mm -hmm. It's not. you know, every architect has a, a liaison, whatever they go, exactly. and that is, it's it's kind of like an ad hoc decision in a way. It's unthinkable that you will only work in your hometown, basically, mm -hmm. if you have any ambitions in architecture, right? Mm -hmm. And it's also interesting that many opportunities happen away from home, particularly, precisely, for women and for 
uh, African architects, etc., etc. So, in fact, uh, that I think is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting also the way how the architects or the, the travelers get connected to very specific uh, locations. Mm -hmm. As for example, uh, Las Lecobusiers has very strong relationship to Santigar or, mm -hmm. or to the, the Acropolis. Mm -hmm. It was quite interesting the fact that uh, the funeral no? of the mm -hmm. was uh, mm -hmm. water mm -hmm. from India and uh, some uh, sand from the Acropolis. So mm -hmm. it's quite interesting how the Lecobusier made hundreds of trips through the, his life mm -hmm. but kept it very strong and powerful mm -hmm. connected to very specific location. Yes. And maybe it's quite the same uh, thing or the same point with uh, Utsun because he presented to the competition actually because he thought he was like a, a hometown with mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. very strong relationship with specific architects and, uh, and very uh, specific places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the, the implication of the, of, the, of the idea that the, the, the journey is never from A to B, but the journey is a circuit. Mm -hmm. It's a repetition of circuit. So you basically just, um, there are no discoveries in a journey. Mm -hmm. The journey is a, Only is, validations. Is a validation <laughs> of, 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 of a circuit. I, I found from that point of view, Spiros' uh, analysis of the object coming to you mm -hmm. to be almost like the kind of extreme statement of the same thing. That, 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 uh, and it actually related also yeah, a little bit to your paper. Yeah. That the, mm -hmm. The journey without journey, um, yeah. and, and there are two facets in that. You know, the, the notion of the building traveling to you. One is when you are expecting it; it's almost like a narcissistic projection that I, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it's coming to meet you or to greet you. And the other one is the uncanny one that Freud felt mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that in fact the very thing that you don't want to happen really happens. And it seems like the building can provoke both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what I find very interesting. It's kind of ambivalent. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a bit of a character that the building is uh, mm -hmm. sort of, uh, mm -hmm. projecting. Uh, so it's always two sides. Uh, yeah, and and this the, the other the, the other implication is of the circuit is that it's a it's a specific circuit. Mm -hmm. So the Acropolis would be interesting to do an airline map, um, a sort of <laughs> Greek air map, mm -hmm. in which the Acropolis is the center of the network, and you map map onto it all of the various architects who have felt that they had to pretend that they had experienced the Acropolis mm -hmm. in order to be architects. Mm -hmm. uh, in that sense, you're, you're a Khan example of a mm -hmm. almost desperate attempt to simulate mm -hmm. the nervousness of a real-time sketch based on a, yeah, on a photograph. Also how, how the people construct their trouble just afterwards. So yes. mm -hmm. that maybe they yeah. throw it out. So I see he, he, he never, we have never realized how, how exactly he was or not was. Mm -hmm. into the properly so you have a, a real a real mm -hmm. trip and then mm -hmm. the trip that you show to the rest of the, the world through the history right. it's yeah. also interesting how you have to create a separate trip but the real one and the yeah. even the more real one mm -hmm. this is the one it's, it's not real but it's the one that everybody accepts yes. through the history yeah. yeah i was just going to say you know rudovsky of course claims that he uh, that he um, operates as a traveler not a tourist by which you know he mm -hmm insists on a certain sort of slow temporality and absorption of the environment. When you actually look in his notebooks, he can visit seven or eight Spanish towns in an afternoon. And, mm -hmm. and, and the language is, is, is sort of frantic, you know, not having time to photograph, it's raining and moving on, and, and, uh, and uh, a sort of desperate search for the American Express office. And, and so, I mean, there's this incredible paradox of, of these claims to a certain type of uh, performance of a, of a traveler that, in fact, uh, it's amazing, you know, with the documents that yeah. we have. For example, with Freud, we had the essay, right? Of the mm -hmm. disturbance of the memory in 1936. Uh, but recently, only these letters to his wife came out where we find out that, you know, he brain mm -hmm. throughout the three days that he was So amazing. how much yeah. that mm -hmm. could he have could seen? He have seen. Mm -hmm. so yeah. These collateral mm -hmm. documents, for example, even the Corbusier Carnets were missing mm -hmm. for a while. And some are not discovered, actually. Mm -hmm. He deliberately destroyed them. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. All the ones with had the women, with mm -hmm. women uh, right. in their bed. So in these, you see much more ambivalence and much oh. more all the other things that happen in the right. sort of after the morning. So. Mm -hmm. Even the question of the skates and the photos, mm -hmm. for example, in uh, Giuliano Gresleri's book, I mean, where he published all the 
the sketches and the photographs, and he says this thing that Le Corbusier said that uh, the, the uh, camera is a machine for, uh, it's a tool for idlers who do their, uh, mm -hmm. their vision, right. that use a machine to do their vision for them. But any, if uh, he didn't almost, he didn't notice that in fact most of these drawings were clearly done after the, mm -hmm. the photograph. So mm -hmm. he was using the photograph to send to the sketches. So mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. and I find that the relationship of the the trip and mm -hmm. the the idea of the hallucinatory trip, right. I, I'm calling tripping mm -hmm. to uh, mm -hmm. to kind of get into that threshold. Mm -hmm. It's very kind of interesting because the kind of the, the kind of psychological disturbance of time that, that, that th a trip mm -hmm. triggers. Because it may be bad memory or bad accounting, mm -hmm. but it could also be that the trip kind of en has this byproduct of tricking time. You know, the, the actual mm -hmm. trip does mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, mm -hmm. don't. But yeah. I even tried, you know, very naively to graphically superimpose Mount Castle, Acropolis, and the Pyramid, which actually mm -hmm. he never saw. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so the various destinations of the trip, in fact, Which raises the possibility um, that the architect, yes. in as much as they're an architect, don't, don't see anything. <laughs> totally. Uh, in fact, it would be it would be a risk to actually see something and encounter something. So those are not sort of pathological signs of, of strange behaviour or dissimulation and so on. The main mission is to make sure you don't see see anything um, because you're not really there to see, and you don't hear anything, and so. Ah, I, is there, are there any questions from the audience? <laughs> Trying to contribute with some uh, other arguments to the very interesting panel that we are assisting. In terms of the, the journey as a, as a circle, I found a very uh, brief, uh, that I can read a very brief uh, text by Ketglas that says, having the habit of traveling, one may have the surprise of arriving to places, situations, or instants similar to others already lived or achieved. There, there is neither repetition nor copy. There is an unexpected accord among subjects. Throughout time, throughout space, as mysterious and exact as that among the stars of a constellation. To run over those events in the figure they trace always results a suggestive exercise. There is who, having experimented it, cannot avoid departing in every travel towards the, ser the, towards the search of such confirmations. Every discovery coincides with a return. The encounters lead him home. This is the, the trying to make the circle and trying to also bring the, the idea of home that Professor Scott was uh, appealing to. And also, I would also like to bring some uh, other issue in the terms of the local and the universal that uh, Dean Wrigley was appointing. Uh, maybe is also needed an outside eye to uh, redefine what local is. Mm -hmm. This is much also confirmed for me in the architecture of Baragan, that many people would think it's just a Mexican. Of course it is Mexican, but it's not just Mexican. It would be African, we know that he traveled. It would be Spanish, we know that he traveled. But also could be in terms of the, the Japanese space, silent and subtle. And I don't know if he traveled there or not. So this is kind of uh, what uh, the travel as a physical travel and also as an imagination travel, which is bringing all this. And also in terms of the route and what uh, Professor Colmina brought up with the Le Corbusier, I had some uh, papers written for the Corbusier tr travel through Spain. And it's very, I mean, I was astonished by the how Le Corbusier felt so much at home in the plane, so happy, so full, so intense. Mm -hmm. And he says when he travels to Spain uh, in 1931, only in the road, he says, there is nothing more eternal than a route 
what is true, fair, the economic, the ingenious, a root is a truth, meaning that the, the itinerary itself becomes, in a way, the, uh, real, uh, the real travel. The itinerary, in a way, offers or evokes itself the discovery of the new and the corresponding encounter with fascination. And this is what I think all these, uh, the architects who travel, we try to get about. And also there's another, the, my last point, I don't want to be so, but my last point about uh, what architects can get from traveling. And also uh, quoting some of the notes of Le Corbusier, very interesting notes, saying about the, what he calls the instinct, instinct, the instinctive administration of beauty. For him, architectural trips provide this extremely important attitude to architects the instinctive administration of beauty. For Le Corbusier, the health of human destination implies body plus heart plus instinctive administration of beauty. And not only at the time of the visit, but only viewing the papers. Because I think we all travel today through all your presentations, what means that it's not only the travel itself, but the whole uh, travel beyond that travel. Well, there was one of my, uh, let's say, comments. Thank you. Jorge, do you have a question, Jorge? Um, I, I was fascinated by Gatlin's careful reading of the, of the notebooks uh, of Le Corbusier. And uh, I had, uh, in particular, I was interested by <coughs> your attention to Le Corbusier's um, <coughs> Uh, recording of social class and social status and his ability to compare himself or uh, to ministers that might be traveling next to him and the bags that they're carrying and how might he, you know, get the same bag and, um, I, I, you know, in looking through some of the uh, Hindenburg papers of people traveling in the Hindenburgs, I know that people when they entered the Hindenburg were giving a list of fellow travelers because it was going to be a long trip so that they might socialize and so on. So I was wondering whether uh, in the research that all of you have um, carried out on traveling, the modes of traveling, you know, to what degree does traveling also signify an opportunity for both networking but also for a kind of stepping up the social ladder, a kind of class, a conf conferral of class, being able to get the first class cabin, being, being able to travel on certain boats, on certain, you know, ships and not others. Um, I, I was I was really interested in the way that he was very particular about the, you know, the airline and and the seat in the airline and uh, and so on. So I was wondering whether there could be a kind of a very just basic class issue going on of a kind of aspirational travel that had to do more with what kind of seat you get and who you might be sitting next to than you know the place you're going to and so on. And whether that was something common to other research or or, or not. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, the, the seat, I think, it has to do with the view. He's obsessed always with what you see from each window, right? I mean, that's why he complains about Air France and you, you're practically, they are not poor, poor, uh, poor horses. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you see the wings and the, 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 he's just completely annoyed by that. So the seat, no, I don't think so. But he's, uh, he's, I mean, I didn't focus uh, on this on the, on the paper, but he's uh, attentive to who is in the plane or in the ocean liner, clearly. Right? I mean, so he, you know, the minister is the only uh, um, allusion that I did in my talk, but there are definitely many other instances in the, in the, in the notes where he mentions other people. But more important than that for Le Corbusier is really like a, com I mean, he, he feels alone in the plane. That's what he likes. It's not about interacting with other people. It's precisely that nobody is bothering him for once, right? For 68 hours until he gets to Rio, for all these 50 hours on a plane until he gets to, to a, nobody's calling him, nobody is demanding anything from him. Suddenly he has time for him. Something that we all experience, actually. Don't you love to be in a plane and there is no internet and nobody's calling you and there is nobody bugging you? And suddenly you have a chance to think about some issue for all these hours, right? And it's a unique opportunity. Mm -hmm. There's a moment in the journey to the East where I said there was a current thing to St. George just before reaching up and where he is very much annoyed by the fact that they are sort of separating the rich from the poor mm -hmm. and they're treating them very differently mm -hmm. in the way that they would be mm -hmm. treated in the island. Uh, but, you know, the, I was 
was thinking when I was seeing Beatrice's uh, presentation that he really traveled a long way because mm -hmm. uh, in between Constantinople and uh, Salonika and Athens, he was traveling in a boat almost, I would assume that he was even sleeping on the deck and mm -hmm. that's what he was saying, together with 120 crowds, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Together with the animals. So the yeah. conditions were sort of dramatic. Right, right. And, and in the end, uh, it's the opposite. By the time he's traveling in Air India, he's always traveling in first class, etc. Et <coughs> I mean, in terms of this aspiration, I think it, um, we would have to do more work to try to understand whether there are other kinds of professional travelling as much. There, there would be an argument that says that, for a number of reasons, the architect was the first kind of global professional, which picks up, of course, on on the kind of uh, mm. incredible transit of the of the of the medieval masons throughout uh, Europe. You go back to ancient Greece; there were state architects. Mm -hmm. that were responsible for all the major commissions uh, in the Roman Empire, the same thing. There was already the local, global, local, international architect phenomenon. So in a certain sense, there may, it may be that the, the comfort of the architect in those transit lines has to do with that being a kind of um, built, built into, the, into the discipline. Mm -hmm. But one thing about the, the thing, of course, the thing about uh, Pep, Kirkless, because uh, he's somebody who doesn't like to travel. So I, I, I think this very poetic uh, uh, account of travel comes. Yeah, so so he's becoming somebody who doesn't move who theorizes travel, but something in what in what he said it was as always very uh, beautiful, and it makes me think that it, another way to say this thing about the circuits it's it's to do with tracing, that you trace the circuit, and I think that it, it may be good to remember how how um, how important tracing is in the, in the architectural discipline. Again, going right back through medieval, going right back, they picked up again and again and again. You, could, you, could, you can write a history, a professional history of the architect as a history of modalities of uh, uh, and tracing. And we maybe some of us are of the last generation. The circuit is to be deflected, never interrupted. So again, it's just a, a deflection. It's never about discovery. Mm -hmm. uh, it's almost a kind of massaging of the line, a line that was there before you started. And I, and I think that it, it might be interesting just to consider what happened, what happening, happened to the uh, idea of the trace uh, over the last 25 years or so. Certainly the, the um, uh, Sydney Opera House s story can be very much understood in those terms. And not by accident, the, during, the, during the five years of really, of a kind of frustration at a technical level, that was the beginning of the most advanced computer analysis in architecture. There's something even Gideon picked up very early that that there are these extraordinary photographs of the models, with every single surface in the model being treated like a like a like a, a body. All the signals being received and, and and analyzed. So in a way, the 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 that particular project is quite nicely poised between the logic of the computation and the logic of tracing. You see that those drawings that become the celebrated drawings are tracings. They're absolutely about tracings. And he tends to move towards drawings in which the building is just a deflection within big arcs and big circles and big layering. So there's a kind of sense in which a number of different buildings could have been produced by the same series of arcs. And that, that um, also, um, this is to say too much, but there, there, there is a, a medieval uh, logic at work in the vaulting um, that's so beautiful, it seems to me, in, in within the platform. And I think there's, there's a, I think for, there are many, many reasons to keep reconsidering Utzon and his particular straddling of one world and the world that we're currently in. But one of the issues there is that, you know, in all the drawings of Utzon, you often get the, the this contrast between the earthwork and roof work, between mm -hmm. the podium and the shell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the shell is often very, it levitates, you know, yeah. it is a problem in itself, you know, wispy. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, when the sketch is put down. Mm -hmm. you know. And um, so that I think that was always, you know, a, a kind of technical difficulty. And, I, and he, he evokes the Gothic when he talks about those arches in right. Sydney. And, uh, but they, they're not, of course, Gothic vaults, right? So the problem is how to, uh, I mean, I think maybe the, the shell, the sh shell concrete, presents a problem to someone like him, you know, or to other mm -hmm. people as well, for that matter, is exactly how do you bring the shells down to the ground, you know? You, right. 
the resolution of the shell in relation to the ground or the podium is, is a problem, you know, mm -hmm. both formally and te technologically. much um, uh, more uh, extensive in the, in the pilgrimage, in the traveling, is the profession in the different religions uh, in which there is always uh, life conceived as a journey. And I think that one of the difficulties uh, of the Sydney Opera that these um, shells are not only clouds, but also they are kind of secular dome for heaven, which is not mentioned in a way. So I think that add to the tension. And of course, there's a coda that you, you gave a, a beautiful account of it. And then there's a coda, final coda, when Sidney writes to him a letter saying how, that they regret how long it took them to appreciate what he gave them mm -hmm. and inviting him to come back and to finish it as he wanted to finish it. And then he writes back saying, well, now I'm too old and too ill to do it, but I will write a manual book how to finish it correctly. And he gives it to his son, who is actually became a, an Australian, mm -hmm. which I, I found very beautiful kind of ending of the story of, of Hudson. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I think that, the, the, that it was fascinating uh, discussion. But I think in the background, I cannot help thinking that, uh, that it's all against the um, against the basic, um, how would you say, the basic paradigm that is common to East and West is the paradigm of life as a journey, mm. life as a pilgrimage, life as a journey. Mm -hmm. And indeed, those architects and builders who traveled already in the ancient world, it was already international, it was already global, mm -hmm. uh, were actually following on similar patterns set, set about by religious, uh, religious. Uh, uh. No, I think it's super interesting what you're saying, and of course, gets us back to Pamplona, which is <laughs> right on the pilgrim path. Mm -hmm. uh, so not so surprising that the question of the journey has been brought to us from, from Pamplona. I spoke about the airport as an office for an architect. Mm. Uh, that made me th uh, think about also Hudson's um, case. The, 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 um, the way he travels uh, all the time, he works, and, and when the traveling in stops, uh, a, a few years later, the, he, he, he leaves the, the, his work in, in Australia. And, and also, it, it was, I mean, I was wondering, and, um, and does, does it have to do also with the late uh, uh, publishing of, of the journey of, of uh, Le Corbusier? I mean, he does publish uh, a few months uh, before he dies. I mean, it, it was like, okay, uh, my last uh, uh, journey. He tried, he tried to publish it before, you know, he couldn't write, that's the beautiful thing about Le Corbusier, he couldn't write for his life. His mother, he, when he was traveling, the first trip to, he was uh, uh, to the Orient, he was uh, making a living by publishing these uh, articles in the local newspaper of La Chaux de France. But he wrote so badly that his mother had to collect, correct his English, so there's this correspondent that is really unbelievable. I mean, you will have a picnic uh, experience. I mean, it's totally, I mean, he was totally, uh, uh, you know, in love with his mother in some ways, right? And, 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 and uh, so it's an incredible dependency there, but also mortify him. And so until he arrived in Paris, he found his kind of uh, way of, of writing, how you call it, um, how do you call it? Uh, aphoristic, yeah. telegraphic, uh, mm. that many critics uh, say is ungrammatical. They missed the point entirely. He found a way of expressing himself, and then he couldn't stop writing. I mean, totally a psychoanalytical case, right? I mean, <laughs> more than 50 books published, uh, the same number of buildings uh, finished for somebody who couldn't write. And if you go and look at the introduction of the, uh, of the book uh, uh, as published in the end, the first note is precisely of the introduction is to his uh, brother, uh, Albert, yeah? Albert who have defended him uh, or is still in the publication against the, uh, 
uh, the bad writing and, and, and he talks about his suffering, his suffering of because of the incapacity to write. I mean, it's really unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, I so he couldn't, he couldn't sell it probably because he was not very well written and uh, he didn't, then he was a famous architect. Then if they will publish uh, anything and also I think he was extensively corrected mm -hmm. from the original too. But then mm -hmm. you have to say, you know, he was rejected twice, not mm -hmm. once. Right, yes. 1911, 1914. Okay. After he wrote these two additional chapters on the markup and the property, so mm -hmm. that really hurt. Yeah. Uh, and of course, he wanted to publish it as it would probably this first book would also be the last yes. in a way, and that's what it happened actually yeah. in 1965. It, it's kind of like the course is kind of like the Bob Dylan of uh, of <laughs> architecture because Bob Dylan could not sing, you know, and and he talks about how he <coughs> uh, invented a way of singing, yes. and we all love it now, okay. but it was awful. So imagine <laughs> like ima inventing this way of writing mm -hmm. that probably sounded so odd, so foreign in a way, yes. and yet yeah. now it's so normative to yeah. write in the imperative. And laws couldn't couldn't draw, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So in fact, many you know handicaps become actually your strength in so many ways. I think it's part of what we call the facilitating block. Block, right? it's, right. it's, so it's that's something that it's funny. I was thinking about the diarrhea. That it's exactly the image of flow that becomes a block, mm -hmm. right? It's yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's a very ambiguous kind of solution. Yeah. It's something like that. Yeah, yeah. there are these <coughs> moments of absolute flow. Yeah. Uh, in fact, that. Uh, and blocking that can facilitate things like the writing block or yeah. the drawing block, etc. I think with, with Utsun, it, it, again, it, the, the psychoanalytical model would be relevant, um, but we would need to move more carefully. If you go to the end of the story, um, he's very much a hermit and not only retreating to Mallorca, as you know, but retreating from the first house to a second house mm -hmm. because he's, he feels too much intrusion by architectural tourists, precisely, who, who hunt him down, so he creates a second house to withdraw, but ar around what, what could be understood to be the traumatic scene of the Sydney Opera House, there is of course, slightly before and slightly after, these extraordinarily beautiful projects that, that Ken's one of the main um, uh, writers about, and so you can't sort of, as it were, just sort of pull the Opera House away from that set of projects, and, and I think the, the psychoanalytical theory would step in and, and could identify it just it doesn't seem very interesting to do it, but it, I think you could identify in which way that the, the painful scene created a, a kind of research trajectory that he followed. What he said to Gideon, he did in fact do. He mm. does a series of projects which carry particular ideas from the Opera House uh, and, seem to, and, and seem to be fully resolved and seem to be sort of self-satisfied self projects. Um, but then there's this lingering and, and it becomes all, it becomes literally de kind of chemical. It becomes depression. So it becomes a very depressed guy, um, and presumably was always that way. And that if you see those photographs again, this is this very young person thrown into the limelight. Remember, um, there was great tenderness shown to him when he wins the competition. Saarinen, in fact, does the first rendering of his project while they're in the jury. It's incredibly beautiful uh, image, which they don't use. Um, the, 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 the jury actually helps incubate the project. They believe it to be the work of a young mind and, and they, they, they feel very tender towards it. Uh, Arab writes beautifully about the personality of, and then it somehow goes sour, I mean, because the dream and the reality are in really a catastrophic tension. And, uh, I, mean, I mean, getting that stuff up there was a real nightmare. Mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm the weight of the pieces and the temperature changes mm -hmm. and right, all that, right. you know. And the fact that uh, they had to hold it all in position until the last piece came in, otherwise it would just sort of fall apart, you know, so that they had, mm -hmm. I mean, building that thing was really difficult. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. can you have always defended Utsun, it's like with a lot of love and, uh, and mm -hmm. intelligence. Yeah. Um, do you really think it was a, a physical building problem? I think it was a psychological problem. I, I think it, I think it, it was, he, I think yeah. he had, you know, my thesis is that he was at both a spectrum, kind of like a bit of an arrogant and a de <laughs> depressive arrogant. And so, but somehow endearingly, you know, it's like what I was saying before, yeah. a neurotic, yet a lovely neurotic. And so that's, that's my reading of him without knowing anything about him. 
Yeah, maybe. But I mean, I, <laughs> I, I think you know also that there is kind of problems with uh, certain kinds of structures or, or, or concepts, which you know seem to be very promising but can't be resolved. You know, I mean, taking shells down to the ground directly, you know, is extremely difficult. I mean, I don't, you know. Is Candila's work really suc uh, a success architecturally? I mean, it's a question I, I, I have, you know, that how exactly should this load go down to the ground? It's a problem, I think, you know, which, the, which the Gothics don't have because they resolve it, you know, and they, with the technique of buttresses and so on, they resolve the load before it gets anywhere near the ground. I would argue that the yeah. Gothic no, don't have that problem because they are a guild and they support each other and they build upon each other. But, but you know, but it's a lot. It's, it, yeah, but it's a longer, deeper, older concept. I mean, it, it, you know, that's a, It's also that is part of it. I mean, I think that this, uh, this this effort to invent something on one's own, you know, that will over a very short time span be resolved. You know, I think it's it's very difficult. You know. Mm -hmm. To, to do that, and I mean, it is interesting. I think Bagsbach Church, Bagsbach Church, which follows, you know, basically, I mean, does get resolved because the the rolling shells are taken into uh, mattresses at the end, and then they're dropped down into vertical. I mean, he, he resolves it, you know, resolves the shell in relation to the load going down to the ground, and I think he resolves it much better in Kuwait, you know, where the shell forms are built up. Out of pieces and, and go down on you know, prefabricated vertical pieces that are similar to the vertical, the, the spanning shell pieces, you know, and is able to to post tension on them and resolve the relationship between the two. Mm -hmm. But I think in Sydney he could never, you know, the the way the the things go down in the podium is mm -hmm. really problematic. You know, not only from the point of view of the enormous stress, mm -hmm. but architecturally also, I think it's mm -hmm. not. Yeah, so, so you think he was, he was too too uh, too young? He had he had enough 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 experience with this kind of structure at that time. Yeah. Eh? No, but I mean too young in the sense that he had not es uh, experimented enough with this kind. Of, I mean, the one thing that struck me about this whole thing also is that I kept thinking about this question that I brought at the end about uh, uh, you know. Uh, young people uh, being trusted to do, uh, mm -hmm. like, uh, if for the first time, really, I mean, the, the Jesse Rice had not, uh, and uh, uh, Nanako had not done any, anything at or all. Alejandro Zairapolo. Or Alejandro yeah. Zairapolo in Yokohama, or, 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 uh, yeah, uh, Roger. Yeah, eh? Roger. Yeah, in Roger. Exactly. The story, Pupé, the Correcting the, the drawings. Is it always <laughs> that you are trusted? <laughs> Uh, far away, more far away from 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 home, when there is not really. I mean, because that's an. In, I mean, even our own biographies will explain. You know, we no. use. See, he started saying that we were all foreigners in this table, mm -hmm. and it's true. And not only foreigners, but also, I mean, higher. I mean, in a way, we can also say. You might talk about yeah. how terrible mm -hmm. it is that uh, is all with the local is always untouched and so on. So, but foreigners, my God, I mean, here we got a really an unbelievable <laughs> opportunity, <laughs> no? We are all foreigners. We are because, all foreigners. Because the, the geese, right. I mean, I, I didn't come geese. with an invitation. The geese, mm. enti you know, <laughs> entitles kind of like you, there is an invitation. The foreigner struggles to get somewhere. Right. And I feel in that sense, the mm. foreigner has both the arrogance of somebody that mm. claims a place and the uh, tenacity mm. of somebody that will stay. And, you right. know, will, yeah, and I feel like that. For in seeing Hudson and well, I see Boyarsky as the contrast, the anti Hudson in a way, in the way you describe it, the mm -hmm. person that it's totally gregarious and totally open. But he also came from you know from Canada. Canada. He was mm -hmm. the unproven one. I mean, he was. He was Canadian. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, mm -hmm. right, right. Well, I, I think uh, I mean I like your your opening analysis, and and we fit the category of. Neurotic, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, neurotic. half-formed, <laughs> half-formed individuals. The, the, the. I f still feel quite some pride in the entering the line, foreign, alien. Actually, it says mm -hmm. um, in the in the airport. So, so there's still a sort of a. It's awkward. But it's inconvenient, but it's correct. Um, mm. And I think that the, of course, New York City is is a little different, a, a little different in that sense. Um, mm -hmm. s not by accident, S Sydney Harbour is also, of course, classically the, 
the point of arrival. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so basically not only was he being invited um, to that harbour, that harbour was the place that it, everybody arrived. So mm -hmm. yeah, it was this you know, young, half-formed, uh, tall, handsome person. I think the, uh, the implication of, of, of Gali's analysis is that it would be something like he may not, may not have got the beauty in the church that followed without the arrogance, the stubbornness to try to make mm. this thing uh, touch the platform as lightly as possible in, what, in a way that seemed, mm. seemed, seemed irrelevant. I, I had the feeling that the structure of the platform is so strong and so continuous because they really still had a lot of doubt about how this, where this thing would touch down. Yeah, so totally. They had, and they had to produce uh, really an artificial ground in the local Brazil sense. I mean, a really military thing and I think the comparison with with uh, Yokohama is really very direct and very very interesting where the where the structure of the platform would actually form the flowing I mean the mm -hmm. structure itself would do the work that the, the aesthetic work that that uh, Utsun wants to put on top of the platform um, and it's true as Ken says in all the drawings that he that actually doesn't touch so well, I think his yeah, ideal section right, would be yeah, limitation. Right, right. <coughs> oh, you know, when he, has the, when he does the project for Zurich, for example, mm -hmm. you know, he has the, again, these uh, folded plates, mm -hmm. and then he never solves the, you know, at some point, because of the climate, you have to have a glass between the, 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 the you, people climb up again on mm -hmm. a podium, mm -hmm. and they must pass under it in order to get to the constable. But what is, what is on the plans that are published, the, 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 this line is never shown. The, the res resolution of the of the glass, you know, in relation to that uh, folded plate roof, mm. is never never really resolved. Mm -hmm. you know? And maybe Kuwait gets cl gets closer to it because there is no glass actually, mm. you know, the, in the in the part where there are the shells. You know? mm. Mm. Um, so. But I was just going to make a problem. small point coming back to actually Galia's question earlier about the lack of hospitality and, um, and Mark just reminded me of it when he uh, talked about Sydney Harbour as a place where people landed and of course I don't know how many of you saw in the paper recently but um, uh, you know Australia has just taken to um, actually uh, incarcerating its um, uh, its refugees on an island off the northwest coast on Christmas Island in a uh, camp situation that mm. uh, resonates with nothing more than Guantanamo Bay. They're actually high security prisons in effect for people attempting to to migrate, you know, who are, uh, you know, escaping uh, violent conditions largely in, in Southeast Asia. I think it's Asia. been going on for some time, hasn't it? It's been going for a long time, and yes. Australia, yes. Actually, they used yes. to um, do the same thing off the Northeast uh, yes. um, Islands. But, yes. you know, so yes. to answer the question yes. uh, about patterns of migration and hospitality, yes. I mean, yes. I think yes. is a really important one. And certainly if you're trying to, um, let's say, you know, catalog types of travel, and let's say this moments of you know, various forms of blockage, I mean, different blockage I know to spare us, but uh, I mean, it struck me also in listening to Ken and, and certainly Ken's invocation of Kuntunitzke, that there might be a whole, you, you'd have to ask the question of how is it that, that um, uh, brief journeys can end uh, in something radically different, like your own visit to, to Princeton, yeah, right, your visit right, to right. Japan, like, yeah. you know, what exactly would be the condition uh, in which a journey becomes, you know, permanent or become right. something else is yeah. translated into yeah. a different yeah. type of category. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in you know, I'm Australian, I can <laughs> point these things out, but, you know, it's, uh, I, I think, an uh, uh, incredibly, you know, complicated sort of paranoia about strangers as a country, of course, that's even um, uh, more full of foreigners than the U.S. in the sense of uh, yeah. how many generations people possibly go back, you know. Mm. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's an interesting yeah. You know, I question. think one of, one of the things which is, uh, would be a sort of subset is those parts which are kind of valves, you know, that exist in Europe, where, like a place like Trieste, for example, mm -hmm. where the, you know, the populations on the edges are constantly mm -hmm. flowing, mm -hmm. you know, between mm -hmm. German culture, Italian culture, etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. there was once an argument made, you know, that uh, good architects come from frontier situations because <coughs> they have to deal with the contradiction of different values arising mm -hmm. out of the Right. Continuous mm -hmm. play between different cultures, like uh, you know, that would fit Mies, of course, in Aachen. Mm -hmm. You know, this kind of right. issue, or yeah. um, Borromini, and you mm -hmm. know, there are other figures that could right. could, could fit mm -hmm. this. Uh, or for that matter, you know, Le Corbusier. After all, he's Swiss, for God's sake. But yeah. you know, he he 
you know, mm -hmm. there's something Frontier about, Frontier yes, yes, you know, yes, yes. <coughs> yeah. it means the Swiss should be the best architects in the world, of course, in that case. <laughs> <laughs> there are nothing else but frontiers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe it's a good it's moment to, to yes. thank Galia for a wonderful, um, wonderfully orchestrated afternoon and again to, to thank our real hosts, uh, <laughs> University of Navarra in, in Pamplona. And I, I really, uh, again, f look forward to the, to the conference in May on the architect's journey. And I think it's important to note that the University in Pamplona has been doing a lot of research on this question and has been studying architects who visit Spain and Spanish who visit outside and they've developed actually a lot of knowledge about that, which we heard a little bit of today, but there's a, lo a huge archive developing and it's incredibly interesting. So again, just to express our gratitude and, and best wishes for your, for your big event. Thank you, everybody.